Hello and welcome once again to The Cinephiles, where each week we enter the world of a great film, we explore its themes, the history, the filmmaking, and the influence it has on us today. My name is Steve Morris. I'm a filmmaker and directing instructor in Los Angeles, California. Hello everyone, my name is John Roca. I'm a voiceover artist, uh, writer, producer, and host over for the Outlaw Nation, uh, and survivor so far of the coronavirus, uh, recording remotely with you for a second week in a row, Mr. Morris. Yeah, how, how are you holding up being uh, stuck in your place? Uh, it's weird. Uh, I feel like I've taken it like a duck to water, but I didn't realize how much more busier I'd be because of generating all the shows on the Outlaw Nation and how much I'm trying to like get content out there for people to turn to my YouTube channel for views. So it's way more exhausting than I anticipated. But overall, mentally, I'm kind of come figuring out my new norm uh, because, uh, you know, whether luckily or unluckily, I've been unemployed since January. So I've had to kind of like, you know, kind of do stuff around the house a little bit more. So I'm used to this. I think a lot of people will have their uh, transition time coming up here soon, unfortunately. How are you? Yeah, it's um, <laughs> same thing. Like uh, the, the I've been hearing all these people saying, oh, I'm binge watching all these shows and I'm on Netflix all day. And I'm like, I'm homeschooling him eight-year-old <laughs> it's not a and and between that and this show and uh teaching which i've been doing remotely via zoom th things are busy <laughs> yeah it's it's complicated um and today so today in honor of the great max von sydow who we lost a few weeks ago we are doing what i think is arguably his most famous film which is the seventh seal mm -hmm. uh, which also brings us into the world of ingmar bergman who we have never done a film of so really, we're, we're jumping into two, two important characters. And first, I want to give a little biography of Mr. Von Sydow. Uh, he was born Carl Adolf Von Sydow. Uh, he was the child of a professor and a school teacher, so a well, very learned family. He was originally going to be a lawyer, and then he saw a production of Midsummer Night's Dream while he was in school, and that's it. <laughs> like most no actors. More yeah, we all wanted to be moment. lawyers, and then we're like, wait, <laughs> acting, I'll do that. <laughs> Me too. I wanted to be a lawyer. I was like all pre-law. I took constitutional law at Berkeley. Like I was, that was the whole plan. Mm -hmm. um, and in he made his screen debut, debut in 1949, but the more important thing is that he joined the Malmo City Theater, and the mm. chief director of that theater company is Ingmar Bergman. Wow, um, and, and that's you know it's funny we've talked about these great collaborations to Shira Mifune and Kurosawa, De Niro and Scorsese, and this is another one. Max von Sydow and Ingmar Bergman they made eleven films together, including some of his most important. Um, he continued working as a stage actor, and really his first starring role is Seventh Seal, which we're going to talk about today. Mm -hmm. And then he became an instant international sensation, which Ingmar Bergman predicted. Like this guy is going to be a big big star. And he didn't want to do it. He just wow. wanted to work in Sweden. Yeah. So he got all these offers and he turned them down. He turned down Dr. No. Wow. He, wow. He turned down Captain Von Trapp and Sound of Music. Ha! <laughs> which he would have been great. I mean, I don't know how good a singer he is, but I mean, he yeah. certainly would be great in that part. And it was finally, you know, what better part than Jesus? <laughs> in the greatest story ever told, George Stevens in 1965. That is the first non-Swedish movie that he did. Maybe he was quietly um, holding out for Jesus. He's like, I, it's, it's got to be big enough for me to leave Sweden. It's got to be. All right, Jesus, I'll do it. Yeah, and then, he, you know, he's just one of those actors that every time he shows up, he's great. Yeah. Every time. Yep. You know, we, the, what, we've talked about him a long time ago when we did Three Days of the Condor where he mm -hmm. plays a terrifying bad guy. Yeah, he does. There's The Exorcist, which is a movie that we've re been requested over and over again, which I'm sure we'll do at some point, but scares the crap out of me. Mm -hmm. His English oh. is so good oh, yeah. that when he uses it effectively in these moments, it's a joy to listen to uh, because you're watching him in the Swedish, because obviously I don't think either of you discovered him in Seventh Seal. We discovered him in English and American films. Uh, or British films, and then to go back yeah. and watch him in Swedish, it's so interesting. You hear the speech patterns are the same, 
But you can tell mm. as it got older, that deeper voice, the gravelly voice, really lent itself to his natural, more relaxed approach to portrayals of any of the characters in any of his films. Yeah, he's got that, you know, the veritas, the stature, mm -hmm. the, the power of everything he does, um, yeah. which is why he could play Ming the Merciless in Flash Gordon. <laughs> <laughs> Not a film I predict us doing on the cinephiles. <laughs> To be fair, we um, considered it. We did consider it for it a brief up. second. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, uh, he plays a king in Conan. Um, yeah. He's he's in Dune. His performance in Hannah and Her Sisters, the Woody Allen film, is incredible. That is a really good movie. I know Woody Allen yeah. is a problematic character in a lot of ways, but certainly he made sure. a lot of good films. Mm -hmm. um, Pele the Conqueror, two thousand two. He's in Minority Report. I had forgotten he's in Shutter Island. Yeah. Yeah, as the doc, as the doctor, yeah, yeah. I just and, and of course the last thing we all saw him in was as the three eyed raven in Game of Thrones. Right, right. I mean, he just a fascinating actor who I just loved every time I saw him. I wish there was more. And it always felt like he was consistently seventy years old. Yeah, like there was never. I don't remember a young Max von Sydow even in this film when you're watching him with his golden white locks. I guess you would say in black and white. He still feels aged. He feels yeah. old. He feels lived world in. World weary. He world weary. Yeah. That's a great term, Steve. Yeah, absolutely. World weary, which is why he works as the lead in this movie for a number of reasons. Yeah. Uh, but throughout his life, I always thought he was just constantly 70 years old. You want to know how old he was when he made this film? Uh, how old, my friend? 27. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Right? Wow. It's crazy. Wow. Yeah. Um, uh, and now I'm going to let's talk about Ingmar Bergman because we've yeah. never talked about him before. And here's the first thing I have to say. This area is a real weakness for me. I'm okay. the farthest thing from an Ingmar Bergman expert. I've mm. seen a few of the films, just a few, like three. I yeah. mean, and I, and I haven't watched them a lot. Like this is just, you know, so I know people come to the cinephiles and think that you and I know everything about everything. That is not <laughs> the case. There are big holes in my film experience, mm. and this is really one of them. Surprising. Yeah, I agree with you. I agree with you. Maybe I've had. I think I've seen Wild Strawberries, Persona, mm -hmm. and this, uh, and that's I, pretty yeah, much. Yeah, I've it. seen Fanny and Alexander is the other one I've seen. Look, and that's the later. That's almost the end. Bergman, oh. Fanny and Alexander. I think. And so, uh, for me personally, I uh, just have never found myself uh, motivated or driven to go discover Bergman films. The same thing with Antonio Nini. I don't find myself wanting to watch his films and Fellini I'm not the biggest fan of to be honest with you uh, and so um, if there's something about Seven Seal though that I thoroughly enjoy and I think it's because it's a philosophical approach to religion and God and our own relationship with that that I find that I gravitate to which the other stuff I don't find as driven to watch well and these themes of religion faith God the meaning of life death these are things you see throughout his films and in reading some of his biography there's good reason. Um, so he's born yeah. in 1918. He's the son of a chaplain who was basically the the chaplain to the king of Sweden. Um, so wow. you know, an important person and sounds like quite an intimidating figure with an intense belief in how his children should be raised. For instance, as a child, he used to, as I think as a six-year-old child, he used to help um, them carry corpses from the royal hospital. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Um, that's where his father was the, the chaplain. Uh, he was a sensitive and needy kid, not surprising. He, <laughs> it, there was a there was a like a prank played on him. It seems like he was bullied quite a bit, and they locked him in the morgue at night mm. um, where he was sure that he saw things moving. And this is like at eight. Um, terror of death, constant nightmares. There were strong punishments in his household for transgressions. And when I say strong punishments i mean yeah. strong pu punishments where his father told him that this was because i love you and now you must beg for forgiveness wow so there was a lot of yeah and we uh, see and that in also, the movie we'll get to it i'm sure but we'll see that kind of aggressive approach to religion or faith uh in the movie but yeah absolutely uh he grew and of course he grew up surrounded by religious imagery this is what he said he said i devoted my interest to the church's mysterious world of low arches thick walls the smell of eternity i love that phrase the smell cool. of eternity the colored sunlight quivering above the strangest vegetation of medieval paintings and carved figures on ceilings and walls there was everything that one's imagination could desire angels saints dragons prophets devils humans 
Hmm. Hmm. Here's an interesting thing he said. He says that he think he thinks he really lost faith at the age of eight, but didn't realize wow. it until 1962. Well, maybe sitting in that morgue kind of messed him up. I would probably lose some faith in Jesus and God and everything if I'm in a morgue like that. Well, and I, what I think about is like, I think about the night that's on his journey here. I think that night has actually lost faith. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. But doesn't know, but doesn't know it. You know, right. like he can't acknowledge it. And I think that's very much what he, Ingmar Bergman's saying is that he was eight in 1926, and that is when he actually lost faith. But he didn't realize he had lost faith, faith until 1962. Right. That is just, you know, a, wow. a fascinating way of looking at it. 42 years um, old, huh? Wow. Yeah. Okay. Uh, um, here, here's one of the most significant moments in his life. At age nine, he traded some tin soldiers with his brother for a magic lantern. And a magic lantern was basically a thing where you could project a little show with shadows, mm -hmm. like shadow puppets. And right. that is the beginning of Ingmar Bergman becoming an artist, a director, a filmmaker, huh. a theater director. Um, he also, uh, again, as a very young boy, was sent to Germany where he was at Nazi rallies where he met Adolf Hitler. What? Yeah. Wow. And he was enthralled by Hitler. Says he's the most charismatic, one of the most charismatic people he ever saw and felt deep guilt in his life later on when he found out what that, who that person really was and what he became. Yeah. Uh, I be yeah, he became a theater director um, and directed many of his own plays and started r doing rewrites for film and then wrote some scripts for film, was an assistant director for film, and that's what kind of led him to direct his first movie um, which is in the late 40s, I think, 47. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, he directed for 10 years before he had really his first international hit, which is uh, Smiles of a Summer Night, uh, mm -hmm. which was nominated for the Palme d'Or at Cannes. And then and he had this script, which had been a one-act play um, that he wanted to turn into a film, and that's what became The Seventh Seal. Uh, the play was called Wood Painting, Nobody wanted it. No, it was like, no way. We're not doing this thing. This is not going to be popular. It's not going to make money. Then he comes, has this big success with Smiles of a Summer Night, and they go, yeah, okay. And they give him $150,000. Wow. Just dream Which, budget. Even then, even then, it's not a lot of money. Mm -hmm. That's very, very small. Mm -hmm. um, and they shoot this thing on a, on a shoestring. And, and this shows kind of these things he's going to struggle with throughout his career is – existential angst, life, death, faith. He tended to work with the same repertory of actors and the same crew over and over and over again. Yeah. Um, and, and I really think he is the epitome of the art house filmmaker, in, you know, at least in the United States. I think like when people, th when people think of art house movies, uh, they're thinking of Ingmar Bergman. And maybe mm -hmm. they're thinking of The Seventh Seal. Yeah. He's hugely influential to a lot of American filmmakers, most notably Woody Allen, who, you know, pretty much makes love letters to Ingmar Bergman in lots of his films. Yeah. Uh, here's something Scorsese said about him. He said, if you were alive in the 50s and 60s and of a certain age, a teenager on your way to becoming an adult and you wanted to make movies... I don't see how you couldn't be influenced by Bergman. It's impossible to overestimate the effect that those films had on people. Yeah, maybe I need to revisit them, man. I don't know. I may have to revisit them now that we seem to have a little bit of time, maybe. Uh, <laughs> but, but yeah, I mean, this is, a, this is someone that people speak, uh, like film directors that I thoroughly admire speak so fondly about him, you know, and this is a film that, uh, that has been parodied a few times or... Uh, had homages uh, yeah. from these uh, people who revere his stuff. And uh, I was watching a uh, BFI film critic, I forget his name, but he was saying the one film that I never get any controversy about when I put in my top 10 is Seventh Seal. It is beloved by mm. critics and fans alike. It is one of those films that just permeates, uh, and yet it deals with so many heavy, weighty issues that other films get bogged down in or protested by or what have you but somehow it deals with them in a way that's authentic and real and you get multiple points of views and that's enjoyable and thoroughly fascinating as you watch the movie so yeah yeah i i don't know why i haven't put the time into bergman you know i put tons of time into kurosawa mm. i've watched much more fellini i've watched much more of um the new, the french new wave and things like that yeah i haven't put the hours in and it's like it's i like thoughtful intellectual complicated metaphorical things about the <laughs> existential crises of life i mean i i like that stuff i'm into it <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, yeah. But there's something about but, Bergman that doesn't radiate dyna- dynamism and or dyna- whatever it is, dynamism, I think I'm trying to say. And so you're not necessarily drawn to it. And so it feels more of a relaxed approach to it as opposed to a magnetic approach to it or frenetic approach to it. And maybe that doesn't appeal to both of us just yet. Well, and, Does, and, and frankly, doesn't mean it can't. It's not the kind, you know, these aren't the kind of movies that you sit down and go, I, I'm in for a fun night. <laughs> let's, let's watch some Igmar Bergman. That's not how it usually goes. Well, and the reality is, uh, you and I uh, were unsure whether or not to do this movie with everything that's going on in the world right, right now. And right, this is right. a film that deals with the Black Plague and with mm-hmm. death. And I was like, is that really the movie we want to dig into? Yeah. And I'm actually glad that we did. Um, and we'll kind of get into some of that. Do you remember how you first came to the film? Yeah, I, I, yeah, it was right around that time. Once again, Steve, as we've spoken about many times when I had that mini kind of film school, thanks to my friend there in Charlottesville, Virginia, he, uh, my friend Wade, he had uh, just kind of, he had just graduated the Chicago Film School. For those of you who may not remember this story, he just graduated film school to Chicago University. He was coming back to Tallahassee. I was working overnight uh, in uh, in a uh, television station at NBC. So he would give me homework when, I, when we started to gravitate and talk about films. He would give me homework of films that I need to watch so we could discuss it the next night when I was working overnight we would sit and talk for a few hours before we went home at two in the morning and uh seventh seal was one of those ones that i saw on laserdisc or or dvd it right there in that charlottesville cubicle at uva and just thoroughly enjoyed it and it was only an hour and like now oh sorry it was only an hour and 35 minutes or something so it was a quick uh film to watch but still but incredibly weighty for such a, a quick film yeah, for me, it was I, it was really twice. And it, it's the first time it's just like you. It was in the time where I was kind of becoming a cinephile. Watched mm-hmm. it on VHS when I was probably too young and went, okay. Um, <laughs> and then watched it again in film school. And that is where I did actually gain much more of an appreciation for it. Um, mm-hmm. you know, and, that, and that was sitting in a movie theater at USC with a, with a professor who really kind of talked us through some of it. So that, that yeah. helped quite a bit. Um, sure. Here's just one more thing about pre-production is that he actually wrote this script while he was in the hospital with a stomach ailment. Wow. Um, and all of it, almost all of it was shot just, it looks like you're out in the woods in the middle of nowhere. Yeah. It's all shot just kind of around the studio. Wow. In, in, in exteriors. Yeah. It's a very, very small area. And the only parts yeah. that aren't is the stuff at the, sh- at the shore. Other than yeah. that, it's all just sh- kind of shot near the studio. And he shot it in 35 days from what I yeah. was reading. Yeah. Incredible. Would you, uh, would you like to get into it? Let us go. (laughs) The music that begins is heavy and ominous. We hear a choir, which is definitely influenced by Carmina Burana. Um, We see a (laughs) blackbird flying against the clouds. I mean, how symbolic can we get? Yeah, death. Um, And and then we hear the the words from Revelation. And when the Lamb opened the seventh seal, there was a silence in heaven, and the seven angels who had the seven trumpets prepared themselves to sound. Yeah, yeah. It's going to be a light. Yeah. Go, go ahead. No, go, go ahead. ahead. It's going to be a light. It's going to be a light, fun movie. <laughs> yeah. Revelations is one of those books that I gravitated to growing up as a teenager. I, just, this, the, I was obsessed with you the did. end of the world. Yeah, I was obsessed <laughs> with the end of the world and the, I, the imagery in Revelations. Because, look, the Bible is pretty much do the right thing every book. Uh, but when you get to Revelations, it's like, here's what happens if you don't. And here's what is going to happen to the world eventually down the road. And it's so such a starkly different book from any other book in the Bible that it is almost like an action adventure book or a thriller or a horror all horror. mixed into one. Yeah, horror all mixed into one because the imagery is so mind-blowing uh, about what they're talking about. So to start the film this way is perfect because you're talking about the plague, which probably felt like the Armageddon or the end of the world for people uh, that God mm-hmm. had come down with this punishment like they had read. You know, this is a 14th or 15th century that this film is set. Uh, all of this going on. So it makes sense to start this way. Um, and we see a knight, Max von Sydow, reclining and in front of him is a chessboard. Max von Sydow at this era is so striking. Mm-hmm. He looks like no other human I've ever seen. Yeah. He's so the t- body tall was. and lanky and blonde. Yeah. 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 It's an interesting combo. And the shoulders are perfectly back with a slight hump on his back a little bit. And you're just like, this is such an interesting combination of a body position. 
Um, there's something I'm going to say over and over again in this film, and we can just take it for granted. The shots are gorgeous. Yeah. I mean, absolutely, absolutely stunning cinematography. We see him walk down to the shore. He splashes water on his face. He drops to his knees. He prays. The shot with the sea in the background and his gorgeous face in the foreground is just amazing. We see that he's wearing chain mail with a cross on it. He walks up the beach. And the whole time his uh, squire is laying on the rocks and you think he might be dead, but he's actually sleeping. Right. And let you know they're coming back from the Crusades. He's sleeping with a knife unsheathed in his yep. hand, probably from war, remembering that that's the way he needs to be uh, sleeping and aware of things because you never when an attack is coming. And the camera pans to the chest set, and there's a very slow dissolve to the waves, and then there is death. This image of death in Seventh Seal is one of the most iconic in film. Yeah, yeah. And uh, the, I like what, this is what Bergman said about his makeup. He said it, the makeup was the combination of clown makeup and a skull. Oh, interesting. Which is exa okay. seems exactly right to me. And the knight looks up and sees him, asks who he is, and he says, I am death. Yeah, he didn't. The tone of the actor, which is Banked e Eckerbrot, uh, mm -hmm. is so casual in his delivery. Yes. yes. He almost reminds me of Denholm Elliott. Mm, I can it, see Facially, that. facially, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and he asks, if he, have you come for me? And Death's response is, I've long been at your side. And he says, <laughs> I know. And we hear this dark chorus, and then the subject of chess comes up and basically he challenges death to a game of chess and yeah. then they sit down into frame in just one of the most iconic shots in the history of film the knight playing chess with death as you said it has been parodied all over yeah. cinema and comic books and cartoons <laughs> and everywhere i remember it's in the simpsons like everywhere you can yeah. think of this has been played with and the image is absolutely striking and, and Death kind of is going, well, why do you want to play? And he says, well, as long as I play with you, I'm still alive. And if I beat you, you, you set me free. And they agree. Mm -hmm. And he, he holds out his the chess pieces. And Death, of course, picks black. And we go into the game. Yeah. And then yeah. we dissolve. We leave it. And now we're in this other time. And the squire or who sheathes his knife as he gets up, they kind of mount up. And they're riding away. And watching this, I, I remember the, the first time you're going, wait, what's happened? Right. Is this right. a flashback? Is this, a, was the death a dream? But just like most chess players, you know, this isn't a timed chess game. So there isn't a hit in the clock and then move on to the next move. Right. We have 90 seconds. This is like chess. Chess sometimes, one match can take a week or weeks. Uh, and it just about, so this is, I think this is the way they approached it. This idea of it taking a long time to find out, to play out the game. Because of course, what's going on in the game is going to mirror what's going on in reality for the night. Yeah. Well, and I think one of the things about this film is this isn't realism, you know? Yeah. It's it's not all supposed to you're not going to go like, "Oh, this is exactly how or why this happened." We don't know exactly what mm. really has happened. I don't know that there is a really here. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, but we're riding along and the squire is singing a kind of body song and <laughs> and looking at the silent back of the knight, which I can imagine right, you know, going all the way to the Holy Land, fighting in the Crusades and coming back with Antonius Block, the knight, probably yeah. wasn't that much fun. No, no, which is why he's entertained himself any way he can. Yeah. Um, and, and then we hear the first time that there's all these omens of these bad things that are happening. And this is mm -hmm. our first sort of references to the plague. And the squire kind of asking the knight about it. Yeah. No reaction, no response. Right, um, and we see a monk sitting by the by the pathway, leaning against a rock. And the squire dismounts to go ask him directions, and he walks up to him. The guy doesn't answer. Calls him again, doesn't answer. Grabs him, and now we see his face, and it is the desiccated head of a dead man. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I love, by the way, that there's a dog sitting in front of him because what you mm -hmm. realize probably that dog has been eating him. Oh, yeah, yeah. That seems fair. And he comes back to the knight, and the knight asks, did he tell you the way? And the squire says, not exactly. <laughs> well, what did he say? Nothing. And the knight says, was he mute? And again, the squire says, not exactly. He was most eloquent. <laughs> but what he had to say was quite gloomy. Mm -hmm. Here's an interesting thing Bergman said. Bergman said, the squire is the star of the movie, and the knight is the supporting character. I agree thoroughly. Yeah. 
as I was watching it, you're like, it's his journey that I'm more invested, which is why as I was watching, I was like, I wonder how I'm going to talk to Steve about this because I feel like Max von Sydow is not the star of this movie. It's actually, uh, I think, Yoff, Yon, whatever his name is, Yon's. the knight. Yon's the knight yep. because, I mean, the squire, because A, the squire is not played as like this young kid running behind the knight or anything like that. Like we saw in Excalibur with like Percival. He is played as a person who's, very uh, well composed, just as equal to the knight in terms of his point of views. The knight never talks down to him, uh, uh, and, and he puts up with him, certainly, because the, the songs uh, irritate him. But in any situation that he finds himself in, he is the alpha dog throughout the whole movie. Uh, and yeah. it's his journey of like confronting uh, this whole thing with the plague and what it means and what's going on, whereas the knight is, is uh, uh, off into the lofty conversations the squire is down on the ground doing the streetwise conversations about what's going on. And I, I, I enjoyed his journey more than the knights. Well, and he's active. Yes. Like if he actually does things that affect things throughout the film, yeah. the knight really doesn't do anything right. other than contemplate his own mortality and the existence of God. Mm -hmm. He does a lot of contemplating, but not a yeah. lot of acting. Right. Um, and, and our knight and our squire, they ride by this wagon. And now we go into the wagon where we meet this family that's sleeping. And these are the actors. And this man wakes up. This is Yoff. Um, and walks away from Mia. By the way, the names Yoff and Mia, these are shortened Swedish names of Joseph and Mary. Ah, uh, makes sense. So Yoff gets up. He walks outside. He does a little walkover. He says good morning to his horse. And immediately... <laughs> becomes very likable. He starts to juggle. He's a terrible juggler. Yes. <laughs> Not impressive juggling at all. And then he turns and we hear this music as the camera pushes in and we see Yoff smile. We don't know what he's seen. And then finally we cut to this woman dressed like a queen with a golden crown, holding in her hands a young baby or a toddler who is walking along. And Yoff rubs his eyes and he looks again and the music is gone. And yeah. she is gone. He's had a vision. He runs yeah. back into the wagon to wake up Mia, his wife, and tell her what he saw. And this is B.B. Anderson, mm -hmm. who is one of the great Swedish actresses and one of Ingmar Bergman's most constant collaborators. And he yeah. wakes her up and says, I had, a, I had a vision. And she's heard these vision things before. <laughs> you know. <laughs> and he tells her that it was the Virgin Mary, and she smiled at him, and he, she was clo so close he could touch her, and she was barefoot and she had the baby Jesus with her and Mia just kind of endearingly says yeah. ah the stuff you imagine yeah you know <laughs> and then we hear some other stories that this is not the first time and like one time there was a, a a devil that he had said had done all this thing and painted this thing and then they found the red paint under his fingernails which meant <laughs> of course he did it I love his logic here that he says I did it so that you could believe my I did the fake ones so you could believe on my real visions yep I love the irony of that and then the other guy the other actor wakes up this is scat He's not so happy with them. And outside, we're, there's, it's just very domestic. We're playing on the grass with the toddler, and whose name is Michael. And they say, she says, I want a better life for him. And he says, yeah, he could be an acrobat or a juggler who can do one impossible trick. And she says, what trick is that? And he says, making a ball suspend in midair. And she says, but that's impossible. Mm. And he says, for us, but not for him. Right. I, so Yoff believes in this mystical world. Yes. Because he sees it. He literally sees it. And what right. what is the journey that our night is going to be on? If only I could have proof. If right. only I could see God. And Yoff, of course, is the person who does see these things. Right, right. But nobody believes him. Well, and that's the thing. And that's the thing. And how much would a knight be driven out of his service if he was like, oh, I see God here. Or I see God there. I see whatever. You know, it's not like Joan of Arc, where Joan of Arc was led by these visions of what she right. saw. She says she saw with God and the, the messages. This is a knight who seeks, he seeks to be equal to God. That's what his, and, and that is kind of against the whole thing of God in the Bible, the Tower of Babel, uh, the burning bush. Like if you try to ever be as equal as God, you are never going to achieve a true communication with him, at least the way it's presented 
in the Bible, right? Which is why I like the way the guy does it. He isn't seeking the signs, the signs that just come to him. And so right. he, but he will speak about them and he'll, he'll be a, he'll like let people know about them. But the knight seeks understanding because the knight needs to know why he exists. He seeks an understanding of his existence and then he'll believe in God, right? The actor doesn't need any of that, just has faith in it, believes in it because he sees the visions and that's that. The knight seeks proof of God. Well, it's easy. It's, it's easy to believe if you see the visions. Right, exactly. It's if you don't see the, the visions, it makes it hard. The difference between faith. Um, yeah, and now the other actor comes out and he is upset because he has got to play death. He's yeah. got this death mask and he's talking about, you know, that he's doing basically a gig for the priests which is, you know, about scaring decent folks out of their wits. That's his job, which, by the way, a lot of what we would call theater in the medieval era was these plays that were about scaring people about hell and things like that to keep yeah. them in line. We, they talk about, by the way, they're going to go to Elsinore, which is, of course, where Hamlet is, <laughs> um, which I find interesting. And then we get into this discussion of wouldn't it be better to just do some body theater, which people have much more fun and... Yeah. And it's like, well, the priests want us to do the scary stuff. And we have these contrasts here. These, And this is the thing that's going to be thematic throughout the whole film, is we have these binary structures. So we have the actors with the choice to do body, which people like and have fun mm -hmm. with, or do mm -hmm. scary stuff, which terrifies them of God and the devil and death and sin and things right. like that. We also have the contrast between the actors who are sort of the fun life affirming ones and the priests who are the death affirming ones. And we have the contrast between the knight and the squire that we're going to get into mm -hmm. and their different viewpoints on life. And again, we hear a little bit more because one of the reasons that the priests want to do this scary stuff is because the black plague has come. Yes. And so they want to get the people in line to deal with the sin because the sin is what's causing the black plague. Once again, religion trying to control the masses to believe a certain thing and line them up uh, so they can control them in some way or shape or form. You see it here in the movie. Absolutely. And then we get to this moment where he actually puts the death mask, the skull on, mm -hmm. and then he speaks suddenly in an actorly tone, turning right towards camera, it seems like, and says, To this law, O oh fool, there, there's no retort. Your life hangs by a thread and your time is short. Yeah. So suddenly it gets heavy and scary, and then he just takes the thing off and asks, you know, are, are ladies going to like me in this getup? Am I going to pick up the chicks here? And then he walks back to the walks back to the wagon, and he hangs up that mask. And there's just a really interesting framing of the scene. You know, something we talked about when we talked about Seven Samurai yeah. is Kurosawa's ability to um, frame a shot and to compose the faces in position. And Bergman is a, a different style than Kurosawa, but the same genius. This yeah. shot, we have the death hanging over the scene in the back left, and then we go person to person through the frame. Um, um, and de you know, but de you never, even though they're happy and domestic and in their sort of lives, and Mia and Yaw for saying they love you, death hangs over the scene. Yeah, as it does yeah. throughout the film, constantly. As it does, as it does throughout our lives. Which is why I like his turn and what he says, because it's kind of letting you know what this film is going to really be about. And he feels the need to constantly remind you throughout the movie this idea that life is short and that death is constant. There is no way to defeat death. Well, and, and also like. Okay, so what does this mean? What does right. what does life mean? And that is, right. that, you know, the seventh seal is like, all right, we're gonna die. That's happening. Yeah. So what is the point here? What what are we right. trying to do? Right. Our knight and our squire ride, uh, ride up to a church, and inside there's a man who's painting a fresco on a scaffold. Um, which, by the way, one of the inspirations for this film is a fresco that Ingmar Bergman saw of death playing chess with a knight and that is on uh, hmm. the inside of a church. He asks what the painting is, and he says, it's death dancing with the crowd, which is also from Revelations. And the squire asks, why are you painting this? You know, mm. people don't want to see this. They don't want to be reminded they want to die, that they're going to die. They want to be cheered up. Why don't you Why don't you show some happy stuff? <laughs> and he's like, well, the, basically, the church isn't going to pay me to paint that kind of stuff. They right. pay me to paint this kind of stuff. Yeah, and I think this seems to me like what we talked about earlier in the show about Bergman uh, and the struggles he had in trying to put stuff and like trying to turn this one act and get it produced, right? I'm sure he's essentially right. mirroring what people probably told him. People don't want to talk about this. People want happy theater. They want fun theater. They want to turn their minds off and be entertained. 
and he's the knight. Oh, he's the uh, painter saying, no, no, this people actually, I want to scare them. I want to get in there. I want to get them talking about stuff. Uh, and he says, what if they pay, pay you to do something else? Well, you know, I'll, I'll do that too if they pay me. I like this. The life of the artist. <laughs> and again, it's this binary thing. There's a discussion of what's more interesting, a skull or a naked woman. Right. And he, he says, well, the, na- the skull will scare them and they run into the arms of the priests. And then we, the subject of the plague comes up. Right. And the guy who's the painter, he's seen the plague. And he starts to describe it. And the description is just terrible. Yeah, it's brutal. Boils, the body shivers up, suffering. And that's what he's pointing to on the painting. And you see the squire react. The painter sees him react. And he says, frightened? And the squire says, me? Oh, you don't know me. Mm-hmm. I don't get scared. But clearly he was scared. Mm-hmm. Um, and then the painter says, you know, everybody's scared. In fact, there are crowds of cinders wandering the land, whipping themselves and others to please the Lord. Yeah. The squire's like, they whip themselves? Yeah. And the squire says, you got any gin? <laughs> I've had nothing but water all day. Uh, and then we're at another area in the church. It's near the altar. There is a powerful and disturbing image of Christ on the cross. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It is not, you know, the, you know, and again, this is this thing the painter was talking about is fear and suffering is the part of the power of the church. Mm-hmm. Uh, and he sees a cloaked figure, some kind of monkey thinks in, in a corner of the church and goes to, says, I want to confess. I want to confess as honestly I, as I can, but my heart is empty. Yeah. And the emptiness is a mirror turned to my own face. I see myself in it, and it fills me with loathing and horror. Yeah, yeah. This whole scene is him confronting what you just said, Steve, about Bergman earlier, this idea of having lost faith. Like, his whole thing is that I can't feel what everyone else is feeling. I can't connect to this idea of God and religion and being saved and whatever uh, like everyone else can. What is wrong with me that I can't do this? There's a line, I think, in this interaction where he says, I've spent so much time above others that I can no longer connect to them. And it's almost like he's uh, an introvert almost in that way, you know, that he's like so not connected to anybody else in his own way because of how he approaches the world, a cold, calculating approach to the world. And so he can't connect. And this is what he's trying to navigate with this monk until he realizes who the monk actually is near the end of the scene. But I love this back and forth because it gives you a window into this guy's struggle to try to find a way to, I'm supposed to do this. Why am I not feeling this if I'm supposed to be feeling this? And this is I this I sense is Bergman kind of himself negotiating why he doesn't have the same kind of faith or as strong a faith as, he ha- as others have around him um, in his own life. Right. No, I think that's exactly it. And mm. I'm fascinated by this line. I've been thinking about it quite a bit. And the emptiness is a mirror turned to my own face. I see myself in it, and it fills me with loathing and horror. Mm. And what I think about is, like, what is it about himself that fills him with loathing and horror? And then I go, well, he's a knight returning from the Crusades, Uh, which means that he's been to war. And the whole purpose of the war was to rescue the holy, quote, quote unquote, rescue the Holy Land from the infidels. Mm -hmm. And I am certain that he did some stuff in that war. And if... There is a God, and everything that the church has taught is true, then maybe that was justified. Yeah. But if there is no God, which is what he's wrestling with, Mm -hmm. then he looks at his face and sees nothing but loathing and horror. Right, right. You know, because of what, what has he done? We see this in Henry V, right? That argument between the soldier and when Henry's in disguise in a cloak himself, in disguise, like death is in disguise in a cloak here. And he says, you know, the, the, the guy says, I'm going to go to whatever happens. I know my, my sins are clean because I'm just doing what the king said to do. And Harry kind of in disguise says, well, every soldier's soul is his own to do what they want to do. So you've got to figure out how you can live with the things that you do in war. Uh, I don't, uh, you know, Harry is not asking for your service uh, and removal of your conscience. And that's kind of the negotiation here. And it's always, and when I was in the military, that's certain, certainly conversations we would have late at night. Like if I do kill, am I killing because I'm being told to kill so it's okay? Because I was brought up throughout my religion to not kill, but now all of a sudden, because we're at war, we can kill? Uh, that seems strange. So we'd have these discussions all the time about death and murder and how it's not murder if it's war, but it's totally a murder if it's not war. So it's fascinating. There's a lot of complicated stuff humans do to convince themselves that the stuff they're doing is okay. Very true. Um, 
And right now, what he wants is the 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 figure who we learn is death asks, "You want a guarantee?" And he hmm. says, "Call it what you will." And then he kneels down in front of these bars, and it's sort of him on one side of the bars, and this cloaked figure who is in fact death on the hmm. other side. The shot is incredible, the lighting perfect. Yeah. And the knight says, "Might it be so cruelly inconceivable?" to want to see God through your own senses. Why must he hide in a fog of half-spoken promises and unseen miracles? And this is what we were talking about before because we have Yah mm -hmm. who sees the visions. Yeah, yeah. But the knight can't. And he says, how can we believe the believers when we don't believe ourselves? What will become of us who want to believe but yeah. cannot? And what of those who neither will nor can believe? This is what he's saying. He's saying, well, wait. How come the, are those souls going to be banished to hell and whatever because they can't believe? Are they less worthy than the souls that do believe? Right. This is the conversation you have with the strict people who are very strict in religion growing up, at least where I grew up in Virginia. When you'd speak to people who are knee deep in religion, they're, they're, they legitimately believe if you don't believe in God, you're not going to be saved, that you are going to go to hell. And that is mind blowing for me to conceive of. Uh, because I've always believed that if you're good, you'll go to heaven uh, if you believe there's a heaven. And if you're bad, you'll go to hell if you believe there's a hell. So, But the knee-deep, the, the people who are super religious believe that if you're not saved, you're not going to go to heaven at all. And so he's kind of struggling with this because it seems like this is a hardcore religious time in his world. And coming out of the crusade, Steve, as you just said. Right. And coming into yeah. the Black Death. Yes. You know, the right. plague. Right. Um, well, and I want to I put another layer on that because I agree with everything you said. Mm. But... Did Yoff do anything to earn the visions that he gets? So you mean the actor? Well, yeah, I, I don't know that he's done anything other than, you know, be in love with his wife, uh, take care of his child, do his job as an actor, and navigate that. Uh, I, you don't see him do anything evil throughout the whole movie or be a bad person throughout the whole movie. He's a wide-eyed innocent trying to live his life as best as he can in the world. Well, and has the knight done anything that would mean that he shouldn't get visions? All right, that we've seen, no. But then again, but 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 this is the point: is that mm -hmm. there are some people. It seems to me that Yoff was just given visions, mm -hmm. and the knight was just not given visions, and right. therefore should the knight be condemned for a thing that he had nothing to do with? You know, right. it's not his fault he wasn't given visions. That's true. Um, uh, I think this scene, by the way, and we'll go through it in some detail. This is really the core of the film. Yes, this scene, because then the next thing he says, "Why can I not kill off this god within me?" Mm -hmm. Why must he live on inside me in this painful, humiliating way? Mm -hmm. That is an amazing... And I, this is what I think about. I think about Ingmar Bergman saying he lost faith at eight, yeah. but didn't know it until 1962. Right. That's five years after he makes this film. Mm -hmm. I think the struggle of, why can't I kill God within me? Even though I think this knight has lost his faith. I don't think he believes in God at all anymore. Right, right. But he can't kill the desire for the belief in God. I think there's a correlative nature to this, Steve, with Scorsese. You mentioned Scorsese and Bergman. Mm. Mean, Streets, mean Streets is Scorsese's totally. own investigation of his faith. Carvey Keitel essentially standing in for Martin Scorsese. You know, that scene where he's putting the hand over the flame, the open flame on the oven. Like, he's just kind of exploring what his uh, process is for religion. So it makes all the sense in the world that he found a connection with Bergman's work, especially with Seven Seal. And because you're seeing the knight himself kind of questioning all this stuff and trying to figure out where he belongs with the faith and where faith should be, you know? Yeah, I think Mean Streets is a great uh, analogy because mm. the contrast between the Harvey Keitel and De Niro characters and what that right. means, that's just so, uh, That's I think that's a great analogy. Um, mm. And then the camera sort of pushes in and then the knight says, I want knowledge, not faith or conjecture, but knowledge. I want God to reach out his hand, show his face to me and talk to me. Mm -hmm. How many people do you think have wanted that? <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, any, I think any self-reflective person who struggles with religion has wanted that. He says, I cry to him in the darkness, but sometimes it feels like no one is there. And the shot, death in the foreground, and he's sort of three-quarter profile, and Max is behind the bars, looking forward, the light streaming down onto his face. Um, and then we get the next moment, because... The next moment is, if it, we said it feels like there's no one there, yeah. and then what if there is no one there? Right. And, and the answer is, then life is nothing but senseless horror. 
this is the idea, right? This idea of what does life mean? That the meaning of life is this whole theme of the movie. What is the meaning of life if it's so fleeting, if death is always with us at any moment? Like he said when he first sees death, uh, I've always been beside you. And he goes, I know. Uh, this idea of death always being the eminence of death always. The eminent uh, fact that you're going to die. That is yeah. constantly in any human's mind. But his approach to it, because he's more of a thinker, is to kind of explore and try to figure out, try to research or pin it down. Whereas Yelf is more like, yeah, this is life. This is what happens and I'm going to do the best I can with it while I'm here. You know, whereas he's more like, I need proof of this and I need proof of that. I need to understand why this exists. Why does life happen? What's the point of it? And it's like, what's the point of it? What's, what are you going to find out in the end? You know, and so he's trying to find out. Well, and this is the moment we're coming to because then death says most people give no thought to death or nothingness. Mm -hmm. That most people are just living their lives. Yeah. And but but the knight says, you know what? One day I'm going to stand at the edge of life and stare into dark, darkness. And he thinks, and then I'm going to know. And death is like, oh yeah, oh I get you. <laughs> and then the knight says, the next line is, we carve an idol out of our fear and call mm -hmm. it God. Yeah. Wow, that is yeah. a great line. That's a strong, strong statement against religion. And then the knight tells who he thinks is a monk. Well, this is a question we're going to get into. Mm -hmm. That death visited him this morning. That he's playing chess with him, and he says that this is important because his whole he says his whole life has been nothing but futile wandering and pursuits, and that maybe in this little time before he dies, he can create something with meaning. And that death asks, "How will you outwit him?" And he says, "Through a combination of bishop and knight." He hasn't caught on yet. In the next move, I'll catch him in the flank. <laughs> and that is when death turns to the knight and says, "I'll remember that." <laughs> death cheats. Uh, yeah. As death. Well, I don't works. know. Is it? Yeah. I mean, it, it, I, it, is this cheating? I mean, he's, I mean he, he, he's inducing him into a conversation and hiding right. who he is. So yes, I would say death's cheating. And, and he says, we'll, we'll meet later. And then he leaves and the night is alone. Right. And the night, this moment is fascinating. He looks at his hand and he says, this is my hand. I can move it. Blood pulses through my veins. The sun still stands in the sky, and I, Antonius Block, am playing chess with death. And then he <laughs> smiles. Yeah. What do you, tell me what you think of this moment. To me, this is, this is a window into his character. See, Antonius thinks very highly of himself. Oh, yeah. He has a hubris of a man of intelligence, right? And so he feels that he can exist and have a conversation with God at God's level, at the devil's level. The audacity that thinks that he can challenge death to a chess match and actually thinks he can win. Yeah. All of that is there's an arrogance in that, a conceit in that. And this is why I think God doesn't show himself to him because why would God show himself to him? It would be in essence c uh, confirming that he is uh, his arrogance that he deserves God to show himself to him before he gives his faith to God. So him going like, I can see this, I can see this, I can see this. It's like, it's like Thomas, the story of doubting Thomas in the Bible. Uh, I can see this, but I, I don't know if it's real. It's faith that makes it real in any situation. Um, and so to seeing this uh, point, and by the way, the bishop tonight thing is symbolic too, of course, because that's what he's doing. He's the knight and the bishop is mm. struggle with religion. So that's that, mm. the chess thing. So, and he thinks he's oh, going to, yeah. that's great. And he thinks he's going to outflank death by having this conversation or by in this pursuit to find meaning. He thinks he's going to outflank death and well, death cheats and he can't. <laughs> well, Okay, so two things about this. I, I, I think all of that is excellent analysis. The other thing that I think is there's almost a feeling like he's truly alive in this moment oh, yeah. of yeah, realizing yeah. that I am battling with death. Mm -hmm. Like in a way that he hasn't been alive uh, elsewhere in the movie. He's been kind of an emptiness. Yeah. But at this moment where he's like, like I have my hand and blood is, I'm alive. Yeah. The, the other thought is... There's a moment later on when he's playing with death and he does something and he puts death in check and, and he's laughing and death says, oh, you tricked me. And he says, yes, I tricked you. Well, there is also the possibility that he figured out he was talking to death and told him about a false move that he wasn't really going to do to get death to do something. And he did, in fact, trick death. Yeah, And I possible. don't think we I don't think we actually know. Yeah. Um, we're back with our squire and our painter and they've been drinking and they've been joking and he's just talking about going to the crusades and that, you know, 10 years in the Holy Land, snakes, beasts, heathens, bad wine, lice eats us, fever consumes us, all for the glory of God. <laughs> and they cross themselves 
But then the squire says, and this line is great, and this is, he's such a great character. He mm. says, our crusade was so stupid that only a true idealist could have thought it up. <laughs> <laughs> that is... I was saying, once again, he's the street level guy, right? Uh, yeah. Uh, Antonius is up here with the idealists. But uh, 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 Yon, Yons, Yons is his name? Yons? Yons. He is, Yons, he's down here uh, at surface level with everybody else who's who has a way more, uh, 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 I don't know, brutal perspective on things. Uh, way more, uh, I don't know, just way more brutal perspective on things. Well, and, and it's funny because in, in a way, this is the mirror of the previous scene. Because yeah. to some degree, they're both scenes about the meaning of life mm -hmm. and is there meaning in life. Both of them are kind of acknowledging that there might not be a meaning. Right. Um, and the squire is looking at it from a sort of practical, earthy, funny way. Yeah. And the knight is working, looking at it from this deep, religious, existential way. Um, but they're, they're mirrors of each other. And we come back to the topic of the plague. And I love the one line where I think it's, I think it's Jans who says, wherever you turn, your rump is always behind you. <laughs> and the painter <laughs> contemplates it and goes, that's a profound truth. Um, and this whole time, by the way, Jans has been painting his own painting and he holds it up and it's himself. And he says, here's Squire Jans. He grins at death, scoffs at God, laughs at himself and smiles at the girls. He lives in a Jans world, believable only to himself. Ridiculous, but all for all except himself. <laughs> and that is when the night enters. And the squire continues and says, meaningless to heaven and of no interest to hell. <laughs> I mean, this is a whole philosophy. Yeah, exactly. Of self-mockery. It mocks all meaning in the world. It says, this is, I'm an insignificant person. Right. Because there is, because life has no significance. Right. And the knight grabs the painting, looks at it, and then goes, let's go. Yeah. No, And we're outside. Where a woman is chained up to the stocks. That's where, you know, medieval torture device Mm -hmm. And the knight asks, what's going on here? And they say, well, she had carnal knowledge of the evil one. She's to be burned tomorrow to ward off the devil. Right. This kind of stuff really happened. Yep. We really yep. did burn people at the stake because we thought that would stop the plague or we thought they were witches or we thought they're, you know, mm -hmm. you know, had intercourse with the devil. Mm -hmm. By the way, this didn't probably happen in Sweden at this time. It was a, maybe a century or so later that this started ah, to happen in Sweden. Gotcha. But the knight is suddenly fascinated by this. And he leans into her face and asks her, have you seen the devil? Right. And there's no response. And she just kind of groans. And we hear her screaming as the knight walks away. It, it's interesting that he is, if he can't get God to talk to him... Maybe he can get the devil. Right. Once again, the hubris of it all. Like his exploration uh, is layered with so much hubris. Like, tell me what it's like to be with the devil. Tell me what the devil is like. And the devil speak to you, blah, blah, blah. And just walks away. And the guys are all like, the knights, the other knights that are there are like, get away from her. She's going to give you the plague, blah, blah, blah. He doesn't care. He just wants no. the, he wants that knowledge, whatever the cost is. But here, here's the interesting thing is death has asked him earlier, are you afraid of death? And he said, no, yeah. I'm not. Right. Yeah. I think he totally is. Mm. You know, I, I think because if this all had no meaning, he's terrified. Yeah. He needs to know the answer before he's going to die. What's he stalling for with death? He's stalling to know the answer. That's what I think. I think he's not afraid of death. He's afraid of death without knowledge. That's what I think. He's afraid of death without no right. getting the answers. Because then he really is a useless life in his mind. Maybe more than useless. Maybe terrible. Yeah, Ho lo loathing and horror is what he sees when he looks at the mirror. It's true. We arrive at this sort of burnt out kind of farmstead. The squire goes into this barn, sees a dead body, hears something and goes and hides and out comes out this guy uh, who who's robbing the body. Mm -hmm. uh, this is uh, Raval is the character's name. Mm -hmm. And he takes a bracelet off of this body and then he sees a woman who is also in this barn Right. And the guy says, why well, look so surprised? I steal from the dead. It's a lucrative business. And he gets up <laughs> and she, you can see she's scared and she starts to go. And he says, you know, it's no use running off. There's no one around, no one to tell. And he right. moves in on her. And we know, you know, that this is, he's about to rape her. And then uh, he pushes her past the door and there is the squire. Mm -hmm. And the squire recognizes him because this was some guy at the seminary. And he says... Ten years ago, you convinced my master to join a noble crusade to the Holy Land. 
this is the guy that sent them on the Crusades. Yeah, you yeah. think of what he must blame this guy for. Right, and here he is, petty stealing yes. from dead bodies. Once again, seminary, religion, what is religion really to someone who is down at this street level? They see the real holes in religion, the real lies, and the people who practice it, how much more uh, sinning they do. And you see this guy, and he's like doing the things. He's about to rape this woman, too. Like completely doing whatever he wants to do because he has that uh, limited power. And once again, this goes back to what he had said earlier, where he said only an idealist would have dreamed the Crusades up. And this is one of those yep. idealists. And look how, how much of a lie it is. Yeah, ex ex that is exactly what I was going to say. Mm. And, and he says, I suddenly understand the meaning of those 10 wasted years. Yeah. We were too well off, too satisfied. The Lord sought to chasten our smug pride. So he spent you to spew your holy venom and poison my master's mind. Wow. Talk about contradictions and dichotomy within a sentence. To spew yeah. your holy venom. Yeah. Uh, it's great. Mm -hmm. And basically, he tells him, get the hell out, and if I ever see you again, I'm going to mark up your face the way they do with petty scoundrels of your kind. <laughs> and the guy, he tells it out of there, and our squire goes out to kind of fill his, his, uh, his water skin. He's washing his face. And this girl, whose name in this movie is the Mute Girl, that is, mm -hmm. the, that is her character's name, she stands silently. She watches while he washes, and he stands up, and he grabs her and kisses her. Yeah. And she pulls away and he says, Jag kunde våldtagit dig. Och så medan jag trött på den sortens kärlek. Det blir lite torrt i längden. I could have raped you but I've grown tired of that kind of love. <sighs> it's an interesting film, you know. Remember this is what the 1950 something and 57. You get yeah. this up 57 and you're like, "Well, how do I take this line because to the, up to this point, he's done heroic things. He's been a good guy." But here he is speaking of rape as a casual way and to say that he's tired of that kind of love uh, is a kind of brutal line to say, for, which implies that he's been raping women on the Crusades. Yep. And it's, what's, what's interesting is he feels like he deserves some credit for not raping her. Yeah. You know, like, I just saved your life. I should be able to do this. So right. I must be a good guy for not doing it. And then he says, well, I need a good ha a housekeeper. Are you a good cook? And she says, yeah. And he says... Well, don't just stand there gawking. I saved your life. You owe me a great deal. And he walks away and she reluctantly follows. And, th yeah. and the thought I had watching it is like, even in being saved, she is still owned. Yes. Right. Yes. You know? In a patriarchal society. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. And he yells at her. He barks at her to come oh, yeah. with him. So, you know, it's not like he's a and clean savior. And we're now seeing the show that our actors are putting mm. on. We have our three actors. It's not a great show. Um, <laughs> they are, you know, playing parts and singing songs. And and then there's this moment where we see there's a blonde woman in the audience. And she is just making eyes at Scat, who has a beard. <laughs> and, and he exits and goes to the back. And he's out back fixing his makeup. And there is this blonde that was making eyes at him. And it is just shamelessly flirtatious oh yeah oh yeah <laughs> it's very clear what she wants he is very over. clear <laughs> oh yeah oh the bend over is just hilarious <laughs> between that and pulling out the chicken to offer him and the wine it's like oh i kind of i kind of get what's going on mm -hmm. and they head off into the woods together and through all this whole thing we've heard the songs from the other side of the show um and some of it is kind of body and then some of it becomes about the black one who stays on the shore Obviously a reference to death. Mm -hmm. And as they start singing this more serious stuff, the camera pushes in on them and their reaction changes. And they are suddenly frightened. And we turn around and see what they're seeing. And there is a procession of monks and flagellants. <sighs> People you know, whipping themselves. They have sensors that are the things that put smoke out. And so it's very smoky. And there are people screaming and beating themselves and suffering. And it, and there's that, they're carrying that cross we saw before that is so brutal. And it is basically what that painter told us about, which is these processions of people punishing themselves to get God's love back and take away the plague. It 
made me very reminiscent of Excalibur after La- with the Lancelot mm, crew sure, after yeah, totally. he's walked away, you know, and they're all walking there and saying negative things about. And so you see this, and this is you know you see this in many places. I mean, in in uh, what was the film with Tom Cruise, The Da Vinci Code, right? There was the what well, Paul mm. Bettany's character he beat himself. You know, and there are there is a secting sect of the Catholic or Christian religion where this is practiced all the time. This idea of having to whip yourself because you are because it goes back to the idea of the original sin, and you must whip yourself to feel the crucifixion of Christ. It's your way of feeling His sacrifice for your uh, existence in the world, and so it's just it's it's a brutal, brutal, extreme way to look at religion or uh, perform in religion. It's just so. It see, I, frankly, it just seems so crazy to me. Yeah, I mean, it is. you know, we uh, we just did Life of Brian recently, and there's, you know, I can't explode some of these things as brilliantly as the Bunny Python crew does, but mm. like some priest said, "Hey, you know what? Jesus suffered this way, therefore you should suffer to show that you love him. Right. Do this, and the bad things that are happening in the world, like the plague, that's mm-hmm. because you're not doing this enough." And everyone goes, "Okay." Yeah, and like the idea that a person who can preach compassion and love and forgiveness really wants you to take a whip and beat yourself with it, yeah, is just again to me that seems crazy. So you and mean yet, a father? You mean a father telling a child that they need to beg for forgiveness when they've done something wrong? Wow, right? I mean, that's that his dad is those people. Damn, damn, that you just blew my mind. You're a hundred percent. That is well, a that absolutely. Right, well. Right. It, 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 and well, and this is where I also go, like, I wonder, did, I think you're totally right. Mm. And I wonder, did Bergman think that consciously or was this just unconsciously Great question, what man. he was yeah. doing? Mm-hmm. Um, the scene, by the way, as brutal and horrific as it is, is also beautifully filmed. I, the the yeah. note I wrote down is like, it's almost like a musical number, mm-hmm. you know, it is so formalized and so choreographed. Um, and you watch these people slowly, each one kneeling down as this procession passes in their different body positions. And there's an amazing shot because, of course, our knight and squire and the mute girl are there where he's in the foreground, the mute girl's in the midground, and the squire's in the background. It's all very formally shot. And you see the reaction of the people who one moment before were watching the body show of the actors mm-hmm. and having fun are now in this moment, watching the horrifying show of the priests and their procession, and you see them all kneel and are terrified. Yeah, yeah. And this is exactly the converse. This is exactly the conversation that the actor had with the other actors about playing death or playing something fun. It's exactly the conversation that the painter had with the squire. Right. About what do you paint? The scary stuff or the naked woman? Um, and then a priest stands up and he just lays into everybody. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It says you're all going to perish from the Black Death because you're all sinners. And he points to the old man and the greedy person. There's a pregnant woman. He points to her and calls her lustful. And you see her embarrassment about being pregnant. It is just absolutely brutal. And the last thing he says is, but be merciful to us for the sake of Jesus Christ, your son. (laughs) And then the procession continues and they move along yeah. on their way. And there's this top down shot that's really fascinating where you see the whole procession going from above and then there's a dissolve within a dissolve within a dissolve and then the hillside is pathways empty. Yeah. And it's almost as if they kind of just were swallowed up by the earth. Well, and also this this thing is uh, interesting because once again, it's I think I think whether consciously or unconsciously, I think Bergman is taking shots at religion here. This idea of the permeating oh, thought yeah. of religion has to dictate policy or dictate how we go about our world. But people who use religion to be sanctimonious, to be judgmental of others, uh, other human beings, that's them warping religion to fit their own personal points of views and thereby undercutting the actual point of religion, which is to be of, of comfort and, and warmth and to show you hope in the afterlife, if not this life, and to use it to you know, uh, judge other people when you yourself are a sinner and always will be a sinner is I always felt is the most horrific thing about religion. Humans can twist anything. It doesn't matter where the religion is based from. Humans can twist anything to make it fit their own personal points of view and use it to hurt other people. And this is, this is 12 years out of after the end of world war two. Right. And you know, the time of the Holocaust and it's at the height of the cold war. So Mm. there's, 
so much where humans have just done these horrible destructive things to each other or are opposed to do more horrible destructive things all in the name of these ideologies Mm -hmm. and a lot of that has got to just seem like madness yes complete madness Mm -hmm. we're it's later on we're with the squire in the night and the squire is just kind of going do they really expect us to take all this seriously? I mean, is that what the <laughs> expectation is? And the knight laughs, and he's like, kind of, I'm not kidding. I've heard all the stories. I've heard the Jesus stories and the Holy Ghost stories, and I took them all in and, and basically saying, I believed them all too. I went to the mm. Crusades. But now I've come to the other side and going like, how could they possibly expect us to believe this? Mm-hmm. Uh, and then we see a guy we saw next to the blonde woman who went off with the actor, who's this big dude with a hammer. He yeah. shows up asking, where's my wife? <laughs> uh, this guy's named Plog. He's the blacksmith. <laughs> um, and they say, and, and the squire says, I don't know, but if she looks like you, I'd, I'd be best to forget her. <laughs> um, <laughs> and he says, oh, maybe go check the tavern. So we end up in the tavern, and there's a pig on a spit, and there's people pouring drinks and people talking, and what they are talking about is all the bad omens. Yeah. Um, all about people dying, about the plague, about uh, Judgment Day, Yeah, you know, people running from the plague. And by the way, a lot of these extras are just some people that Ingmar Bergman pulled out of an old folks' home. <laughs> he just said, you have good faces, and he put them in the movie. But the, the music grows more ominous, and then this word about maybe it's Judgment Day. Yeah. Maybe Judgment Day is coming. Yep. And then we see uh, Raval, the guy who was the, you know, robbing the dead body, and he's trying to sell that bracelet he stole, and we see the blacksmith who starts talking to Yoff, who's just there, obviously, to have, like, a drink and a bite to eat. Yep. And he's asking about, hey, have you seen my wife? She ran off with an actor. Right. And at first, Yoff is just... Kind of playing along. Oh, that's too bad. He says, oh, an actor, that's terrible. He better just let her go. And he goes, no, I'm going to murder the actor. It's like, whoa, 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 why are you murdering actors? <laughs> and I think Yoff kind of knows that this is his buddy Scat that did this thing. Mm-hmm. And then it suddenly gets scary because Raval says, no, he's an actor. Mm-hmm. He's lying to you. Yeah. And at first Yoff is going, ha ha, that's funny. <laughs> and suddenly it doesn't seem very funny you turn pale you have a guilty conscience he's like no what's going on and then suddenly the grave robber uh raval has a knife and he slams it right between his fingers which yeah. i'm sure is done as a reverse shot and then yoff looks around at the faces yeah and he realizes he's got no friends here mm-hmm it's a scary moment. Well, and that's how it can be, right? This idea of all of a sudden turning people who are already in a state of fear and worry and concern, they see something they can turn their anger towards. And there's no real logic here. They, they, these people don't know him. They don't know this blacksmith and give a shit about him and his wife. It's a matter of who can we step on because we feel powerless in our own lives. Let's go step on him because we're being led by this Revolve character who we don't even explore or investigate is a petty criminal and grave robber. I think they do know the blacksmith. I think we're in the blacksmith's town. Right. I think but I don't they don't think know the actor. All right, fair, but I don't... Oh, okay, all right, maybe you're right. Maybe you're right. And so they're willing to turn on the foreigner... Uh, in their town. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's a good point too. Yeah. And y'all was like, hey, if I bothered anyone, I'm sorry. And they go, oh, why don't you stand up so everyone can hear you? And he gets mm-hmm. up and apologizes. He says, oh, well, you're an actor. Why don't you do a headstand? He does a headstand, <laughs> he falls over. <laughs> and they go, well, why don't you get up and dance? He's like, well, I really can't dance. They go, imitate a bear. And they grab a torch and they're basically, and the, and the camera is below him looking mm. up. And, it, and we can't quite see what they're doing to him. And they have torches kind of below him and maybe they're burning at him or hitting the torches. But yeah. it's really scary and it's really upsetting. And he he falls down. And then when we think that maybe they're going to beat him to death or something, it's yeah. really scary. Then we see the squire. And the squire says to Raval, Remember what I said if I saw you again? Yeah. I always keep my word. And he slashes the guy's face. Yep. And the actor, Yoff, grabs that bracelet and he runs the hell out of there. (laughs) We dissolve to a beautiful shot of the knight reclining near the shore. That gorgeous chessboard is in the foreground. And what is he watching? He's watching Mia and the baby. Yeah. And this scene is, this is the most lovely scene in the whole movie. Yes. I mean, its whole tone is different. 
And they're kind of talking about the child and talking about the husband and talking about, you know, what he's going to become. And she says, maybe he'll become a knight. And he goes, that's not much fun. (laughs) And she shows concern about him. Like, you don't seem happy. And the knight says, I'm in dull company. And she goes, with the squire? And he goes, no, myself. Mm. It's a a great, great moment. Yeah. And then Yoff shows up uh, looking all beat up. And first she thinks like, oh, you've been drinking again. Mm -hmm. No. She goes, oh, you told people about your stories. No. And then he kind of says what what really happened. And she is sympathetic. He does exaggerate a little bit. He goes, I roared at them and scared them away. (laughs) You know, that didn't really happen. (laughs) And and Mia introduces uh, her husband to the night. And she says, I picked some wild strawberries and I have some fresh milk. We'd be honored if you'd share our humble meal. And she goes off to get the food, and he asks where they're going. And, and Yoff says, well, we're going to Elsinore. He's like, don't go that way. That's where the plague is. Um, and why don't you come with me to my castle? And I'll, and I'll go with you. And then Mia comes in and brings the strawberries. Strawberries, by the way, very symbolic in, in Sweden. Uh, they are symbol of summer. Um, obviously, you know, Bergman's next movie is Wild Strawberries. Like, they're, they're very significant mm. for him in terms of rebirth and summer and life. And then the squire and the mute girl shows up and they offer them strawberries. And now we're having this meal and Mia lies down and there's a close up of her in the ground. And she says, she says, one day is like another. Nothing strange about that. Summer is better than winter because you're not freezing. Spring is best of all. Yeah. There's something that's just, it's hard for me to describe, but Yoff and Mia are just living their lives. They're in the moment. Yeah. They're present. Yeah. They're not thinking about the great questions of life and death. They're just Mm -hmm. here. And it almost feels like this scene is a moment carved out of time. And then we have one of these amazing shots where, again, that skull, that mask, is in the upper left-hand corner. And then Yoff, who's with his liar, then Mia, then the bowl of strawberries, and then Max down right. Mm -hmm. And we cut to this question about, was the knight ever in love? And he says, yes, once. And then he talks about a really romantic description of his life with this woman. He says, we were newly married. We'd play endlessly, wrote songs. I wrote songs to her eyes, her nose, her beautiful ears. We hunted together. At night, we danced. And she offers him a strawberry. Hmm. I think this is the moment of life. You know, the strawberries are about life and love. And And you see in his expression of this man who's been very empty throughout this whole film, Mm -hmm. And then the next thing he says is, faith is a heavy burden, you know. It's like loving someone out in the darkness Mm -hmm. who never comes no matter how loud you call. (laughs) But that's how he sees it, right? But the truth is, he's looking for signs that he wants, but he's not seeing the signs that are there, right? He has a woman who loves him, and they had these beautiful moments in the sun together, beautiful moments in love. That's God. That's love. Right. You found this per- person. You're, the problem is that you're not appreciating the life that you actually have because you want it to be a certain way. And because it's not a certain way, you think you're, be, uh, uh, you think you're being left behind by God or ignored by God. But the truth is, just because you ask for something doesn't mean God has to give it to you. What he does give you, though, you should appreciate it if it brings to your life joy. And we'll see later on that his wife stayed around when everybody else left because of the plague, because she loved him and because she wanted to be there for him when he came back. And he's not appreciating the great things he has in his life. Even the songs that the squire is singing, he shits on instead of appreciating the fact that he has someone who's willing to entertain him the whole time. Once again, signed by God. He could have been assigned an idiot squire or a moron, but he's assigned a talented squire and a squire who can hold his own no matter what the situation is. But instead of appreciating that, he's lost in trying to find what he thinks. And I think a lot of people in life get lost trying to be like, well, why isn't God giving me this without noticing all the things that you've gotten? You know, um, these self-help gurus build a foundation on trying to promote gratitude. This idea that you should be grateful for the things that you do have in life instead of pining for the things that you don't. And this is a squire, because I mean, sorry, this is a knight who is so intelligent and so analytical that he is analyzing himself out of appreciation of the things that he actually does have because he wants other things. And I think this scene exposes that in a very subtle and deft way. Uh, and it's one of my favorite in the movie. It's, it's funny, because I'm trying to think of how to express this because I think, 
I look at this scene differently. It, it's almost like our our, mm. our visions of this scene are very similar, but the angle that yeah. I'm I come at it is slightly different from yours because I think okay. at your heart there is some part of you that's always going to be a believer. Yes. And true. in my heart, there's some part of me that's always going to be an atheist. And so mm -hmm. what the way you described it was you're looking for this from God, but God gave you these things that you are not seeing. Right. So in your framing of the scene, God exists. Yes. Yes. I think or or what I see in the scene is the night so so we have that line from the squire who said only an idealist could send us on something so stupid as the crusade. <laughs> and that we have this, he, the knight is in this moment where he's in love, he has, he's with the woman he loves, right? Mm -hmm. And then what happened next is the idealist came along and told him, you have to go to the Holy Land and fight for the crusades. Right. And so that was him going to serve the God that, does, that, that he cannot see. Because he goes right from talking about his life with his love and saying faith is a heavy burden you know it's like loving someone out in the darkness who never comes no matter how loud you call is that then he went to seek god and found no one right and so in my mind it's not the you you know your framing is that you wanted this from god but god gave you this and in my framing it's like you left the thing you had to seek a god that doesn't exist mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and what's interesting is that i think in this moment He's, I think he is realizing that mm -hmm. because what he says, the next thing he says is how unreal this all seems now here with your husband, how sig insignificant all of a sudden. Um, and he says, I will remember this moment. Yeah. So yeah. that the, the moment of sitting with these people who just love each other yeah. in this beautiful setting, in this moment of spring, eating these strawberries is more real than the God that he sought for years that never appeared to him. Right, right. He goes on and says, it's very poetic. He says, the stillness of the dusk, these wild strawberries, and this bowl of milk. Um, your face is sleep the sleeping baby. I'll try to remember what we spoke of, and I'll hold this memory in my hands like a bowl of fresh milk filled to the brim. And then he drinks. Yeah. He says, and it will be a sign for me and a source of great satisfaction. Yeah, yeah. Do you know what I think this scene is? What's that? This is communion. This is the body oh, and the blood. And if you point. look at... The way he holds that bowl and yeah. drinks from it, it's like he's drinking from a holy chalice. That's a great point, Steve. Yeah. I, I, it's, it's funny. Like, I think there's some films where we can overdo symbolism and we can get really intellectual about it. Sure. It's like, just watch the movie. Yeah. Was, just enjoy the story. Like Airplane? This yeah. is not one of those. Yeah, this is not one of those films. <laughs> this is all symbolism. Oh, yeah, totally. Uh, scene to scene. Um, Absolutely, man. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and then suddenly the knight stands up. And he moves out of frame, and we have a shot of the ocean in the background, and he, the knight is looking, and he's in the foreground, and then he steps out of frame, and the music grows ominous, and you know what's about to happen. Yeah, yeah. The death steps into frame. And then we're back to the game. Mm -hmm. And he says, oh, yeah, I gave away my strategy, and I beat a retreat. And, but he's smiling and the, and death says, what are you so happy about? And he says, that's my secret. And he moves and, and takes his knight. Yeah. Then the knight, it's interesting. I hadn't thought about it until you said he takes his knight yeah. and this is the knight. And the knight says, as you were meant to, mm -hmm. and he's laughing and death says, did you trick me? And he says, of course. And this <laughs> is where I go. Was this a recent trick or was this, did he actually trick him when he sh revealed his plans in the church? Yeah. And then this other thing happens, which is that he looks back at Yoff and Mia and Death sees them and Death goes, mm -hmm. oh, are you escorting the jesters through the forest? The ones called Yoff and Mia? And suddenly the knight's nervous. Why do you ask? And the Death smiles and says, no reason. Yeah. That is a very threatening moment. It's a chilling moment. He's essentially threatening those uh that family and i think this is where the squad uh, the knight uh gets the idea of tricking death uh long enough for those for that family to escape i think this is where the idea starts to begin in his head about sacrificing himself and everyone with him in exchange for this this family and why because this family just wants to live and live in their world yeah. and it isn't caught up totally. with the existential nature of life. And they see the visions. They see these things. Although he doesn't know that they see these visions, although she did say his visions about the demons and Ned when he came back from the beating. But he he wants them to live because he sees them as a pure 
thing to exist in the world, a good thing to exist in the world, especially coming out of the Crusades and especially coming out of dealing yeah. with the Black Plague. Yeah, totally. We're in the tavern and we're with Plog, the blacksmith, and Jans, the squire, <laughs> and, and he's weeping and bitching about his wife and they just kind of go at a typical drunken dude <laughs> to hell with women, let's insult yeah. them, you know, calls them all sorts of names. But it ends <laughs> with Plog saying, but I... St- but I love her. But I still love her. And I love what Jan's response is. He says, listen, you misguided ham. Love is nothing but lust with a lot of cheating lies and general tom- tomfoolery thrown in. <laughs> um, which is a great line, particularly in contrast to what the knight just said about his love. Yeah. Because we just had this kind of love put up on a pedestal. And now, of course, we have our squire going, ah, mm. it's just lust. And then he said, the squire, the squire is a deep dude. I mean, he, and yeah. and I think smarter smarter than the knight because the knight's just asking these questions and going, why can't I have answers to this stuff? Right, right. The squire has some answers, and one of them is love is the blackest of all plagues, and the only pleasure would be to die of it, but it almost always passes. Plog says, well, mine won't, and he says, yeah, only a few wretched fools die of love. It all <laughs> fades, and then and then this next line is so great. If everything is imperfect in this imperfect world, love is the most perfect imperfection. Mm. Agreed. <laughs> Agreed. Well, then you have to, what does that mean? I, I, I agree that love is the most perfect imperfection because it's never going to be like you see in the movies. Uh, love is right. it's not easy. It's tough. It's sometimes it's it, hopefully if you're with the right person, it's 90 percent or 85 percent joyful. And the other 15, 10, 50 percent is you negotiating things or arguing or battling. But if you've got someone who loves you, th- they love you for who you are. Exactly. And you love them for who they are and you figure it out. So it's a perfect imperfe- imperfection because. This is how we're built as human beings because nobody is perfect. And so thinking you can find someone uh, who's going to be completely perfect for you, the A to Z theory that someone once told me once a long time ago <laughs> uh, is that is the true situation. You're only going to find A to a certain number, certain letter rather. You're not going to fill all the letters of the alphabet. And so if, it, if it's far enough along for you to enjoy it, that's the perfect imperfection. Although he's a bit more bitter about it, uh, clearly. Yeah. Um, so that's where I don't actually, I don't know if I agree with you that he's smarter than the knight. I just think he's too matter of fact and the knight is too lofty. So somewhere in the middle is the correct way to probably exist in the world. I really like that you explained a line that I didn't under, really understand with a theory that I told you <laughs> years ago. That's yes. Nothing can be better. And, 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 and the next thing, the blacksmith is just looking at John, John's in awe and kind of says, God, it must be great for you to be able to talk like that and to be able to believe all these things that you say. And Jan's response is, who says I believe it? <laughs> See? Which I love. Yeah. Because he doesn't believe in anything, nope. even himself. Nope. You know, that's the difference. Um, and Plog asks if, "Hey, you guys are going? Can I go with you?" And we head outside, and who do we see outside but the actor? And Plog <laughs> runs up to him to apologize, and and and, and Yoff is going, "Whoa, whoa, whoa! Hey, stay away!" And we get some great <laughs> comic relief. This is, you know, Ingmar Bergman loves Shakespeare, and this is he does this throughout this film. Is that we're in this heavy, heavy movie, and then we have these fun scenes with the blacksmith and with yeah. the actor and stuff like that to lighten it up. Yeah. We're in the forest. Again, this is not really a forest. It's shot right outside the studio in the city, but it's beautifully lit, dappled lighting. We're riding along. He, uh, the knight is in the lead, and he has this you know hood over his head. It just looks great. Yeah. And we've got all our guys now. We've got the knight. We've got uh, the actors, and we've got our blacksmith with his hammer. And, and then we spot Scat, <laughs> the actor, and his wife. Oh, well, there they are right now. He goes off and chases Scat. They chase through the woods and up right back in front of the um, wagon where they get into an argument. And it's just one insult after another. And I love that the squire is giving hints to the blacksmith of good ways to insult the actor. Yeah, yeah. The squire, in essence, is live tweeting this match. Live tweeting this. <laughs> he is just he's sending in tweets for to respond, to help the other person respond, and then sits back and kind of like comments on this back and forth and the sudden change from someone who was going to destroy scat to someone who is slowly starting to respect scat out of nowhere yeah. and seeing the girl change from someone who was making fun of her husband to someone who runs around to the other side and starts to uh, yep. love back up on her husband in order to avoid 
uh, being in the losing uh, camp. It's inf- and he's commenting yeah. on all of it, which is fascinating. And having a great time and laughing. Yeah. And they ask him, you know, I think it's the one the actor or, or Mia that asks, like, why are you laughing at this? And his response is, in southern lands, there are human-like animals called apes. <laughs> and she says, what about it? And he says, just mentioning it. <laughs> okay. I think that's an amazing line. Yes. <laughs> because what I think he's saying is, we're apes. Like we think we're so special, yeah. but we are ridiculous. Yeah. Like, and and that he's just enjoying the ridiculousness. Yeah. And now Lisa, the uh, blacksmith's wife, is asking to come back. And the squire, again, like you said, live tweeting. He's predicting everything she's going to do. <laughs> now she's going to cry. Right. Now she's going to offer to cook him his favorite meal. It's brilliant. <laughs> it's brilliant. And of course, it all works. And then and then she's so horrible that she's now going to her husband. Hey, now kill him. Right. Kill this actor that he I seduced me. and ran yeah. off with. He, he tricked, tricked me. me. I didn't seduce <laughs> yeah. him. He, tricked, he seduced me. And, and Plog now is kind of going, well, he has to pr- provoke. I just can't kill him. Right. He's got to do something, you know. And the actor's going, well, how do I get out of this? And he runs away. He pulls out a knife and in a very dramatic <laughs> way stabs himself in the chest and says, farewell, my friends. Pray for me and dies. <laughs> um, and of course we all know that it's a fake knife Yes. and Plog is so upset and weeping he says I was just starting to like the guy <laughs> um, and John's the squire is sort of enjoying all of it and we all head off and now the actor is alone and he pops out the fake knife and is just very pleased with himself I played that scene beautifully <laughs> um, but he's a little nervous he wants to go where there, he can't get hit by bears or wolves so he goes and climbs a tree and as he climbs to the top of the tree who should appear but death? Yeah, death. Scat is sitting on a branch, hugging the tree, and says, okay, and tomorrow I'll hook up back with my friends, and we'll go to Elsinore, and everything's going to be great. But then he hears sawing, and he looks down, and there is death cutting the tree out from under him. <laughs> and he tries to talk to him, and he asks who you are, and he says, death. <laughs> and he goes, I'm cutting down your tree because your time is up. And he tries to negotiate out of it. I have a performance and death says canceled on account of death. My contract (laughs) terminated my family, my children scat. You should be ashamed because I'm assuming he has no family or children. Exactly. Exactly. He says, he says, I am ashamed. Um, And then he tries to negotiate and there's no negotiation, no loopholes, no exceptions. He opens his mouth and does a silent scream as the tree falls. And then a squirrel pops up on the stump. (laughs) The squirrel was just an accident on the set. That oh, wasn't planned at all. Yeah. Yeah. I was trying to look um, up symbolism of the squirrel, and I was like, nope, there's nothing here. <laughs> yeah, it's just a squirrel. Just a squirrel. Sometimes a squirrel is just a squirrel. <laughs> <laughs> We're riding again, um, and the music is ominous, and the sky is dark, and Plog looks up at the moon, and they don't like it. Things are too still. Things are too quiet. There's no wind. There's not a sound, no fox or owl or human voice behind, besides our own. And a great shot of the night turning around and looking back. And the music is very scary. And then what do they see? But in a cart, guards bringing the woman on the stake through the woods, through a stream. It gets stuck in the stream and they all have to help get the cart with the woman they're going to burn at the stake out of the stream. Yeah. Which is a weird thing because it's like now they're complicit on some level in killing this woman. Yep. We get out of the stream and again, the knight is fascinated with this woman. And he goes up to her. He asks her about the devil. And to me, this is exactly what he did with the, with the priest, death, yep. in the church where right. he's asking about God. Now, he couldn't get any information on God. Now he's trying to find, please give me some answers about the devil. Why? And he says, I must ask him about God. Surely he knows. And she says, you can see him anytime. How? And she says, look into my eyes. And he does. And he says, all I see is terror. Yeah. And she goes, nothing else? Nothing? No one? And it's almost like she's disappointed. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Because she believes that she is seeing the devil. And he's like, I'm not seeing anything. And then she says, he's there behind you. And the knight turns into frame and looks. And there's almost a moment where he expects and almost we expect to see him or see death or see something. And he sees nothing. Mm-hmm. And she says, the fire won't hurt me. And he says, did he say that? Yeah. And then he 
repeats with such intensity. Did he say that? Because, and I, this is where I go back to, I think he's afraid of death. Yeah. You know? Okay. Is like, he needs to know that there's something there, mm -hmm. you know, something beyond this world. Mm -hmm. And they're looking down at her and a soldier comes by with, you know, some flames. Yeah. And then the knight gives her something and says, this will still the pain. And again, it's almost like communion, isn't it? Yeah. Yep. Like it's the wine and the wafer. Mm -hmm. And he holds, and he reaches out and he touches her face, beautiful close up. And he's looking into her eyes and it's like he's trying to see the devil. Yeah. And she seems to calm. And I don't know, maybe he gave her some kind of drugs or something like that. Mm -hmm. uh, and he puts his hands over his eyes. Um, and when he removes his hand, her eyes are closed. Yeah. Uh, why do you think he does that? I think he does it. I, I, it's a measure of sympathy or, or empathy or connection with her to kind of try to ease the pain of what she's going to go through. Maybe he realizes this is something he's seen before or done before in, in the Crusades, and, and maybe this way he dulls her pain a little bit before she dies. What about you? I, I, I definitely think he wants to dull her pain. I'm thinking about the closing of the eyes because there's this thing of she's seen the devil, but when he looks in her eyes, he sees nothing but dumb terror. Right. And I, so there's part of me that he doesn't want to see her eyes anymore. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Oh, yeah. Um, yeah good point. There's a huge blazing fire, which apparently got totally out of control on the set, and it smoked up the whole neighborhood, because this is not anywhere far where there's houses and everything all around here. Smoked everything up. And they lift her up, and we see her look through the smoke, and then he says, who will look after the child? Angels? God? Satan? Emptiness? And the squire says, emptiness, my lord. Mm -hmm. Whose response is, it cannot be so. And the squire says, look at her eyes, lord. Her poor mind is making a discovery, mm -hmm. emptiness. Yeah. And the knight says, no. Because I think what's happening is that she believes that the devil is gonna keep her safe and she's not gonna feel pain. Right. And she has total faith in that. Yeah. The faith which for the knight has been shaken. He doesn't have faith. You know, he's lost faith. And now in this moment, as she starts to burn, yeah. she's feeling the pain right. and realizing there is not only no devil, there's no God, there's nothing but emptiness. And that is her discovery. And he can't handle that. Yeah. Because he, he sees himself in her a little bit. Like I think so. He's trying to find that, he's trying to find that faith and realize there is no faith. In essence, is like burning at the stake and feeling the burn uh, till his death. Yeah. Well, and I just go back to, I lost my faith at eight, but didn't know it for 40 more years you know yeah good point like good i point. just go i just go back to that is that this is the moment of realizing oh there is no there's nothing there right um and the, and they right away and the camera pushes in on her as she burns unconscious oh man crazy yeah. um it's later on the knight is sitting at his chessboard mia is singing to the baby and lisa says to plog that she's afraid she feels something will happen but she doesn't know what and again, this word of doomsday mm. comes up. And then we hear a scream. <laughs> and it is Raval. Mm -hmm. And he is dying of the plague. And he's begging for help. Mm -hmm. And John says, keep on the other side of the tree. And he goes back and says, I am afraid to die. I don't want to die. Take pity on me. Mm. And the girl, the mute girl, wants to help him. And now remember, this is the man that was going to rape her. Yeah. And now she wants to help him. And the squire grabs her and says, it's useless. <laughs> and he says, I'm dying. What will happen to me? Take pity on me. Is there no help? And he falls. And again, the squire repeats, it's useless, utterly useless. Hmm. And the guy screams and falls in agony and dies. And the thing I was thinking about is like, okay, here is the guy from the seminary who inspired the knight to go on the Crusades. Mm -hmm. The knight who is now after the Crusades struggling with his faith. Yep. This guy is now afraid to die because he has no faith. Maybe, maybe never did. Right. You know, because um, again, this is like, well, what is, he is now facing death. What is our knight facing throughout this whole movie? He is facing yep. death. And in a, in a way, I think this is the screaming voice within the knight's head. Mm. That's you know that that that's what I think. Yeah, it's a good uh, good point. Yeah, okay. 
And we cut to the knight who's sitting in, again, an amazing shot. It's redundant at this point. The hood over his head. He's sitting there with the sword cradled in his arm, making yeah. a cross, the cloak around him. And death steps into the frame. Shall we spill our spill till slut? Shall we finish our game? <laughs> and he sits. And this is when he takes the queen. And you see the knight go, I didn't see that. And now we know that death is just sort of playing with him. Mm -hmm. And then Yoff looks over and we realize he sees death. Yeah. And he tries to tell Mia, look who the, the knight is playing chess. Do you see who he's playing with? And of course, she doesn't see anything. He's alone. What's the big deal? Mm. And he says he's playing chess with death. And then Yoff goes, we must leave. We have to get out of here. And we're back with the game. And Death says, you look worried. He says, are you hiding something? And this moment is great. He, in response to, are you hiding something? The knight says, nothing escapes you. And Death repeats, nothing escapes me. Mm -hmm. And then he says it differently. No one escapes me. Mm -hmm. And he admits he's worried. And of course, what he's worried about is he realizes that Death is interested in Mia and Yoff right. and Michael. Yeah. And so now he's going, I need to stall. And so what does he do? He reaches with his sword to switch it to the other side and with his cloak knocks over the chess pieces. No, and then he claims to not remember where they were. Death, death yeah. gives him a smirk and then he says, oh, it's good for you that I do remember and puts them back exactly yep. where they are as the wagon disappears. So yeah. And he sets the pieces back up and the wagon is gone. He asks Death, what do you see? And Death says, I see mate at the next move. Yeah. He says, true. And Death asks, did you gain by the delay? And the knight says, yes. Because this is, he did one good thing. Yeah, I think this yeah. is what he wanted, to do one good thing. Right, right. And Death says, when next we meet, the hour will strike for you and your friends. And then the knight says, and you will reveal your secrets? And Death says, I have no secrets. <laughs> and then he says, you know nothing? So do you know And Death says, I am unknowing. Yeah, you know nothing. This is my favorite line of the movie. I am unknowing. It's yeah. It's not. There is no active nature to death other than what it is, and that is to take souls off the planet. It is unknowing because it does not need to know. It does not aspire to know. It has a job to do, and it does. It does not question it. It is uh, timeless, and it is constant, and it is. There's no way out. So, what does he need to know? That would be a fun little film, though, Death Exploring Why He's Death, which is, of course, the sound, uh, what Neil Gaiman does in Sandman uh, mm, when yeah. you see all that. So, like, this is, I like, I like what, I like him saying, I am unknowing. It just struck me this time, like, oh, that's a powerful line. Well, and I think the, the knight expects that death is connected to God and the devil right. and angels right. and the afterlife and this whole order of the universe that he's trying yep. to discover. Yep. And what death is saying is, Maybe that exists and maybe it doesn't, but I have nothing to do with it. Right. I am unknowing. I don't know if it, I don't know. And also the great terror of there is no knowledge to be gained at the mo moment of your death. Yeah. When that day comes, there could be nothing. So as Antonius Block contemplates the unknowingness of death, he is given time to Mia and Joffs to escape. But Things are not going that well for them. The music is ominous. They're frightened. There's a thunderstorm. And they say something terrible is happening. And there's even the fear that he has seen us, which he, I can only assume, refers to death. Mm -hmm. And finally, they, they stop the wagon. They huddle in the back. Yeah. And we hear the line, the angel of doom is rushing past. It's, it's a scary moment, I think. Mm -hmm. And then we dissolve to our other characters who are off back at the shore and they walk up to the castle and they cross this looks like an interior drawbridge or something in the shadows and we were ride at Antonius Block's castle. Well I mean you don't and you're looking at this and you see, you're seeing all the you know the wind and the rain and all this thunder and stuff and and you go back to what death said which is you know I I see everything. I remember everything. Nothing can escape me. So the whole time you're watching the sequence going, well, maybe what Antonius did really mattered nothing at all. Because in the end, death will take who he wants to take. And in those moments, uh, you're kind of feeling what Joss feels. that It's, it's useless and they're going to die. Um, 
but then, we, like you said, we end up back at the castle, and we don't know the results of this situation just yet. Well, I think one of the interesting things about this film is there is a certain inevitability of the of death. I mean, like there there isn't a sense, even when yeah. maybe you have a little bit of hope that the knight could actually defeat death at chess, but not much. I mean, and as we go on this journey, and we know death right. is coming after them. This is not a, we don't see a happy ending coming. No, it doesn't feel like No, that. And one of the interesting things I think that we start to see is the mute girl, who obviously has had no mm -hmm. lines, she starts to become more important in this strange way. Mm -hmm. Like the camera keeps lingering on her. She keeps being in the front. Mm -hmm. She keeps having looks. And, we, and, and I think it's really hard to determine, like, because she doesn't speak, What's happening with her? It feels it feels like, and what we're going to lead to, of course, what happens with her is this almost like reverse thing where, you know, how God or Jesus would heal people. Um, it almost seems like in death she might be healed as well when she says what she says later on. So, but yeah, you can see that certainly they want you to focus or take her into account as we're rounding the final bend of this movie. I think so too. I think that's exactly what's going on. Um, and we step into this room and there is this woman who is standing by a fire and she turns and sees these people enter her space mm -hmm. and she throws a log into the fire and she doesn't look happy. It's almost an expression of like, oh, and here you are. Not joy. Because of course this mm -hmm. is the knight's wife. This is the woman that he spoke so romantically about in the scene with the strawberries and the milk, and yet now that they stare at each other, and it's so the opposite of a romantic reunion, you know? Yeah. And yeah, she, yeah, yeah. she walks up to him and says, I heard you were coming home, so I waited. The rest have fled the plague. So, right. so she is risking her life on some level to stay here for him, and then she says, don't you know me anymore? Yeah. And it seems that they've both changed. You know, she says, hidden deep in your eyes is the boy who went away so long ago. And, it's, and this is why the casting of Max von yeah. Sydow, who's 27, but looks so much older, is is so great. Because let's say, let's say that this character mm -hmm. of Antonius Block is the same age as Max von Sydow, which means when he left, he was 17. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And now he's come back. And so her saying, hidden deep in your eyes is the boy who went away so long ago, that has a lot of significance. Right. And then she asks, are you sorry you went? And he says, no, but I am tired. I think that's a great, mm -hmm. a great line. Yeah. Well, and you look at this situation is like, what, how many people who've returned from war, um, A, don't recognize a little bit the person because they haven't been around that person for how long and B can you can only imagine the kind of experiences and the wear and tear that Max von Sydow's character went through in the Crusades yeah. uh, and what that must do to age him right this idea of you know you're not the young man that you were when you left because remember when he speaks about you know when they're having the strawberries he speaks about her in such a loving yeah. uh, way that's almost nostalgic almost a remembrance of the innocence of their time. And, you know, it's a little bit of a subtle, not, it could be seen as a little bit of a subtle shot at the idea of war. This idea of sending people off and how war can change people and how it takes a, a little bit to recognize the person once they come back to you because no one knows you better than the person who loves you and can see every difference in your face or in your eyes uh, so instinctively. And I think that's, What's so interesting about this exchange, it's not this running to each other and hugging right. thing. It's a very slow movement circling, and then eventually she touches his face. Like, it's not tender initially, and I love that. That's way more believable, I believe. I 100% agree with everything you've said. And what I would add to it is that mm. there's this weird way in which war is linked with faith in this movie. Because it was his faith yeah. in God that drew him away from his love. 
And this is what he talks about in the strawberry scene is that here right. was this love that was present and real and filled with life. And then there was this unknowing love. And he asked, why did I choose this God who I can't know and can never really know mm -hmm. over this woman who was right there? And that because what he went off to fight is the Crusades, yeah. you know, and because it sounds like from what we've heard that there were some terrible things that have happened in the name of that God that he chose over his love, right. it contrasts like it's rather than God being the source of love that brings people together, God is the source of what pulled them apart. Well, you know, and now he's come to the end of that journey and his faith is shattered. Well, how is God, the belief in God? How about if I say it that way? That's what I would say. The human interpretation of what believing in God means yes. is what led to this ridiculous situation of going off into the crusades. It's not God, it's humans' uh, manipulation of the word of God or the belief of God or what they think God really meant. And so they think they can push their narratives and their points of views and their philosophies on other nations, uh, you know, under the guise of supposedly saving them. That's that's what that I, that's a yeah. So it wasn't God, in my opinion. It was humans manipulating the word of God. Yes, you are right. I misspoke, um, and, and even more so, of course, because I don't believe in God. So to me, there is only humans coming up with this stuff. <laughs> so either way, whether it's we go like God is this right. loving, caring person who didn't probably didn't want us to go convert the heathens in the Crusades and reclaim the Holy Land, or if there is no God, right. either way. It's the human's belief in this thing and how they interpret it that led them to do this thing. And she says she's gonna yeah. prepare a meal and there's a look from Max and then there is, again, this crazy dissolve from Max von Sydow's profile to the mute girl. And it's just, this is pure mm -hmm. filmmaking. This is, the, she's not doing anything. The filmmaker is saying she is important. Yeah. And then what do we return to yeah. is the words that the movie started with, which is the words from Revelations. And when the Lamb has opened the seventh seal, there was a silence in heaven. And we dissolve to this meal that is in many ways the Last Supper. She is sitting reading from the Bible. Uh, and we hear you know, these things about the seven yeah. angels, which had the seven trumpets prepared themselves to sound. And interestingly enough to me, John's, the squire, is at the head of the table. I don't know why it's framed that way, but it's very interesting to me that he is the center of the frame mm -hmm. and not the knight. Al right. Although, as you said, he's really the main character. They hear a banging, and Johns gets up to look as we continue to hear the words of Revelations. And again, the camera at this powerful low angle pushes in on the girl who turns into profile and again, it's this, what does this focus on her mean? And I think it creates something in the end, as you were alluding to, very profound. And she looks up at the light that's streaming in through the window. Um, and we hear, and all the green grass was burnt up and the second angel sounded as it was a great mountain burning with fire was cast into the sea and the third part of the sea became blood. Revelations is some rough stuff, man. <laughs> some dark <laughs> some dark stuff. Johns comes back in, and there is a very strange expression on his face. And they ask, was anyone there? And he says, no, my lord, I saw no one. Is he lying? Because his expression is very intense. Uh, no, I don't think he's lying. Yeah, well, he probably for a deep sense of foreboding. I don't think he's lying, because remember... Only um, Antonius and the other guy have been able to see death. Yeah. So um, why would he see death? Because remember, from the beginning, he's been the the guy on the ground giving you the actual point of right. view about things and giving you the unfiltered point of view about things. It isn't so lofty or grandiose. Um, and so he wouldn't see death. He wouldn't see God or anything like that. Um, because to him, he's more practical about everything in the world. And so, but he senses a deep, I think he's, you can tell that he senses some uh, foreboding or something, uh, I don't know, something happening that's, that doesn't feel good. He's unsettled. So when he comes to sit down, it's almost like he's just kind of like just uh, thrown off center and he's sitting down. And then, of course, you think they've escaped the situation because no one's there. And then I just had a full epiphany. And, and, and this is this is the great thing about getting okay. getting to talk to you about these movies because in the conversation stuff comes up 
And and you just made me think about the squire in a oh, yeah. way I hadn't thought about before. And I think it's because it, it, the I'm so focused on Antonius Block mm. and him being confronted with the yeah. destruction of his own faith. Him desperate to find that there is a God, that there is truth, that this does have meaning, and that there will be something after death, and him being forcibly brought right. face to face with the reality that that might not be true, that death is in fact unknowing. Right. And I'm so drawn to the squire who has this much more cynical, this is just about life, all this stuff was kind of BS that we got sold that led us off to do this stuff, that I hadn't thought about the fact right. that in fact he is also getting confronted with the fallacy of his way of looking at the world. Because if he oh, actually yeah. sees death, the mystical uh, yeah. human you know, creation of the thing of death, well then there is more to his philosophy than is dreamt on in heaven and earth. You know what I mean? Like there mm -hmm. is something mystical yeah, yeah, going yeah. on. So even though the knight is disappointed yeah. in his lack of mystical revelation, in some way, the squire is confronted with the opposite truth, you know? Yeah. Because one can certainly interpret yeah. this. That there is, that, yeah. that all of these things existed. Yeah, that all these things do exist and they are real. And so your matter of fact and practical approach and your kind of, you know, undercutting the existence of all this stuff now is like, oh, shit. Yeah. Uh, I don't know what you, you've completely destroyed the construct of my existence. I don't know what to do with that. Yeah. So yeah, that, that makes perfect sense to me. So we're continuing to hear the sounds of the reading of revelations. And the last thing we hear as we see the camera sort of pulling back and back as we hear, and the name of the star is Wormwood. And then everyone looks up hmm. towards camera and the mute girl stands with a expression that is frightened, but very complicated on her face. Yeah. And she moves slowly forward and John stands up behind her and then Max, and again, this is so theatrical and painterly and very, very formal. Mm. And as they look up, we cut to a shot of death standing in the torchlight, lit so perfectly and like just a specter hovering over this group. And they introduce themselves. The knight says, good morning, noble lord. And I think it's interesting that it's morning, which means we've been kind of up all night doing this. And then the knight's wife yeah. introduces herself and she says, I bid you welcome in my house. Uh, and then the smith introduces himself and he introduces his wife and tells her to curtsy. And I love that he even kind of says, you know, we, we have fights sometimes, but you know, she's really, I can handle her and she's a good person. Like that he, there's this need to explain yourself at the last moment. You know what I mean? Mm. Which makes sense. I, yeah. Like I need to, to. It's almost like I have to show you that my life has meant something as it's coming to the end. Right. And then the night. It's almost like a prayer panic. It is so desperate, and he sits standing in the light, and he goes, covers his face, and says, "Out of darkness, hear us. We call to thee, O Lord. Have mercy on us. We are small and afraid and without knowledge." Still desperate yeah. for some truth. Yep. Mm -hmm. Tell me there's something before in this moment before I die. Yeah. And then John's has the opposite reaction. He's kind of like, look, and there are different translations, by the way, of Seven Seal, and I've looked at kind of two of them. And this one, it says, I could have mm -hmm. purged your worries about eternity. Just feel the triumph of this last moment when you can still roll your eyes mm -hmm. and wiggle your toes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Again, and this is where I kind of, this thought I have is like, so in this last moment, the knight is still desperately holding on to there must be a God. There must be meaning, there must be truth. And even though he's being confronted with the fact that that might not be true. And the squire is in this last moment still holding on to, no, just, it's your body. Life is just what it is. Wiggle your toes, roll your eyes. It's just the experience of life. There is nothing else, embrace that. And neither of them, yeah. when confronted in this moment, can let go of those truths. It's true. Um, and then the wife tells the squire to be quiet. And he goes, oh, like he says, okay, but under protest. <laughs> it's like even in this last moment, yeah. I don't really want to stop talking. And then the mute girl moves forward and she kneels and her face looks up. And I don't think it looks like fear anymore. I think it looks like wonder no. and joy and release. And a shadow comes over her face. And she says, 
it is finished. Which is the words Jesus said on the cross. Mm -hmm. It is finished. Right. And she looks happy as she closes her eyes. This is a great point you bring up, Steve, about what she says, the last line, very reminiscent to what Jesus says on the cross. Um, Because it seems like a moment of salvation for her, where she is surrendering her life and the release of it. uh, And she has served her purpose in her mind of her life. Like, just like Jesus, Jesus, when he says as it is finished, that means what he was sent here on earth to do, he has done, and he is surrendering his soul back to heaven. In this moment, uh, with the way she falls to her knees reminds me very much of that old movie about the two women, two little girls who saw uh, Fat- Fatima, Fatima, the Our Lady of Fatima, and they fall to their knees as well. She's bathed in light, which is almost like a holy moment you'd seen in films before. And so in that moment, I think she is saying it is finished, which is her life as being a mute, as being a, a subject of rape, a subject of ridicule, a subject of, a, of abuse, a subject of hardship. Finally, it is finished, and she is happy that she does not have to keep enduring this life anymore. Do you know what I'm saying? And so for some people, death is a release. For other people, death is a thing to be questioned and explored. And for other people, death is something to be angry about or frustrated about. And for other people, it's just accepting that this is the inevitability of life. And you see all of those myriads of reactions in everyone, you know, like when the husband and the wife are like trying to, like he's trying to make her curtsy and all, like all of that is such a weird reaction, but he's not also, the, also he's not the most intelligent guy. So like, this is all just how people react in different ways to death. And I thought it was great for him to capture so many different reactions, because uh, that's how it would logically be amongst humans, a group of humans, I think. That, that's, that's so great. And that so mirrors exactly what I think about the mute girl. And the moment that I think about is the moment where mm. we meet her and the squire protects her from being raped by Raval. And then they're outside and he kind of grabs her and kisses her and essentially says, look, you owe me and I'm only not raping you because I don't feel like doing that anymore. But then in the next moment yeah. says, now you have to be my, ha- my, my cook, my servant, you know? And that even right, in being right. rescued from rape, she has no choice, she has no agency in her life. And, and one can only yep. assume that that has been her whole life. Her whole life has been one of no freedom, of other people controlling her, and probably going through a tremendous amount of suffering. And so now she gets to say, it is finished. Mm -hmm. And and what's interesting too is we have the squire and the knight engaging in this very complicated, intellectual, conceptual idea of what is the meaning of life and what is the meaning of death. She's got none of that because she is the mute girl. Like she, we, we don't know okay. what her thoughts are. Right. And the thing that's so interesting to me is that this is as good an example of a filmmaker speaking directly to the audience as I can think of, is that he's created a character who doesn't speak. Mm-hmm. And merely through how he photographs her, he is creating all these things yeah. that you and I are thinking about. That is a great, great filmmaker. Yeah, agreed. It's Dawn and we're back with Mia and... Yoff and the and the baby is there, and we hear birds chirping, and they come out of the wagon, and they're there overlooking the sea, and Yoff says, I see them, Mia, over there against the starry sky, the Smith and Lisa, Raval, Johns, and Scat, interestingly enough, which means there's no wife and no mute girl. They're not in this shot. And then we cut to this shot, right. which is one of the another of the most iconic shots in film, known as the Dance of Death, and it is death mm-hmm. leading these people up this cliff, silhouetted against the clouds, against the dawn light. This is just a remarkable and disturbing and weird shot. And here's an interesting thing about it. <laughs> this shot was shot at the very last minute. They were out of time. They were out of budget. Yep. Most of the actors had gone home. This is not our actors. This is... A, yeah. a bunch of crew members, assistants, an electrician, and two people that just were visiting the set, and they just said, "Here, put." They put the costumes on yeah. them and shot this shot super fast, and it is one of the most iconic in film history. <laughs> <laughs> it's just amazing. And then, yeah, and then, agreed. and Yoff, it's can, an incredible shot. And he continues to narrate. And my understanding is this also, to some degree, comes from Revelations. At the head goes the strict master with scythe and hourglass. But the fool brings up the rear with his flute, which is scat. And he says they move away from 
from dawn in a solemn mm-hmm. dance away towards the dark lands, while the rain cleanses their cheeks of the salt of bitter tears. That is some beautiful, beautiful yeah. stuff. And and Mia's response is, "Oh, you with your visions," because she doesn't see any of this. <laughs> no. Here's blissfully here. unaware. Yes. And, and here's the question I have, because remember we, when we meet Yoff, we have the conversation about are all the visions true? And one of the visions he kind of faked because he wanted people to believe the other visions. Mm-hmm. Well, if he's really seeing this, and if death really has been a real character in this film, and, and if death really did take these people away, does that mean that all of Yoff's other visions are true? It's a good question. Um, I would say yes. I would say yes. It depends on, uh, I don't, here's what I'd say. I'd say the visions might be true, but how he interprets them is his own truth, but the visions themselves certainly occur to him. That's what I would say. It's, it's funny. It's just occurring to me right now that Yoff and Mia are the knight and the squire. Mm-hmm. Is that you have Yoff and the knight who believe in this extraordinary mystical world, and you have their partner mm-hmm. who is believes in life and believes in no. This is what's important is right in front of me. What's important is our child. What's important is these things. The only difference is, is that Yoff has no doubts and the night is filled with doubts. Yeah. And this is the end of the movie as they move off (laughs) happily and we're with Yoff and the baby and they're going to go off and live their lives. And that is the end. They lead the horse away. We fade to black. Yeah. I found one quote from Bergman that I found very interesting. Someone years later asked him about how he felt about death as he was ap- approaching, you know, his, he was getting really old. And he said, I used to be afraid of death, but now I believe that you go from a world of suffering to nothingness, that there isn't anything beyond, and this makes me feel enormously secure. <laughs> it, is, it is finished. Yeah. It is finished. That seems to be what he's saying. Yeah. Uh, interestingly enough, this movie got mixed reactions in Sweden. People praised it for its cinematography, said it was beautifully made, and they trashed the script. They said the script was terrible. Uh, mm. It went on to win the grand prize at Cannes in 1957. Bergman was shocked because this was a little movie. He didn't expect this to be an important film. Yeah. 2000, in 2010, Empire Magazine ranked it as the eighth greatest film in world cinema. Number eight. Mm-hmm. That is a remarkable number. Yeah. And of course, as we said, this appearance of death has been parodied and shown all over in all sorts of things, <laughs> including, you know, we talked about Woody Allen's influence on it. Do you know the play Death Knocks? No, I do not. Okay. <laughs> death Knocks is a uh, Jewish guy in New York, and there's a knock on his door, and it is death. And he plays Gin Rummy with death. <laughs> and of course, knock to knock in Gin Rummy means a is a, a, a thing you do with your cards um, for the points. And so, so like there's this double meaning. And I acted in this play as death in high school. Oh wow! Um, okay. Yeah, yeah. It's a very very funny play, and it it, it just as you would think. Cool. You know, Woody Allen would deal with it. There's also like the end of Meaning of Life, where death takes them all off. Because of the salmon right. moose. Yeah, the salmon moose. <laughs> so there's all sorts of... Play- and, and I think we said this uh, earlier, is that, to me, this is the epitome of the art film. Like, in the 50s, yeah. when people started to... When intellectuals went to go see intellectual films, they were thinking of the seventh seal. And just in the same way is also mm-hmm. the epitome of the movie that people that aren't into that, who like popular movies, go, ugh. Why would I ever watch a black and white subtitled movie about life and death? And uh, sounds terrible. <laughs> but it also proves that, you know, people who create some of the funniest or most uh, playfully lowbrow comedy are still influenced by some of the totally. great films that have ever occurred. Because if we look at Bill and Ted's Bogus yep. Journey, it's the entire story of this Seven Seal thing played completely for laughs. This idea that they can keep tricking death and play slapstick, uh, you know, physical slapstick comedy with death and all this kind of stuff is played up. But it's only because the creators behind those movies that have seen this movie and revered this movie and thought of it as perfect fodder for comedy. 
in in a different approach but still the idea is there you know and uh, i love that i think that speaks volumes to uh, how influential a film like this can be and you do say as ingmar bergman said himself this is a small film didn't expect it to have such a effect on the world but you just never know what it is you're going to create that will feel universal to multiple generations who confront these universal concepts in life so so i can't speak to the creators of bill and ted's bogus journey but i can certainly speak to woody allen <laughs> and the money python crew and the simpsons crew of like yeah. these are brilliant deep people now you, we might have a lot of problems with woody allen for other reasons but you can't deny the man's yeah. genius or the fact that he is a very deep thinker and so the fact that they go, this is a source for comedy, only comes after the deep thought about what is this really about. Um, I am tempted to mm -hmm. ask you an impossible question. Um, <laughs> yes. And I will throw it out there. And we, we, is that, what does this movie, this isn't exactly your final thoughts, but more, this is a, a meditation on death and faith. And I'm curious, if it affects how you think about those things? Well, that's a great question. I, I find myself, um, you know, I've always been a thinker uh, in that way, and I'm not trying to be grandiose about anything. I've just always been an analytical person and a thinker about everything going on in the world. Uh, and so the idea of death has always been a constant source of uh, conversation in my head since I was a child. I think if you're inducted into religion, it becomes a thing that you are, uh, it's a concept that you are constantly confronted with. This idea that you better be good before you die or this is gonna happen to you. You better do all the right things before you die or this could be the rest of your eternity, you know? And so there's all of that that hangs over you. But as you get older, of course, you come to the realization of like, well, how much do I fear death? How much do I not fear death? Do I get in this car if I've been drinking? Do I get in a car with somebody else who's been drinking? Uh, do I walk across, do I climb up that extra branch on that tree knowing I could fall down and maybe die or whatever? There's all kinds of ways that you confront death in, in, in little ways as challenges to yourself. And then as you get older, and especially me after my losing my father, my idea of death changes. So yes, I always think about death and I'm always fascinated by the concept and wonder what my reaction is going to be when it happens. I think some of the best acting scenes in movies are death scenes uh, because that's when you see new and interesting ways to explore. I still believe Kurt... Kirk's death in, in Generations is one of my, was one of my favorite deaths ever, still moves me every single time, you know? And uh, because the idea of Oh My, which is almost like it's a brand new adventure, and he didn't have any concept that it was gonna be like this, or look like this, and then he dies. It's incredible. And so f this film brings up this idea of the struggle of, well, what's the meaning of life, which is essential, essentially the under underlying current throughout this movie, this idea of the meaning of life. Because if by understanding the meaning of life, then you can understand death. That's how it works. That's the yin and the yang. And so to me, that's what always I come back to. And when I watched this movie, watch it again for our podcast, that's what I thought about the whole time as I was watching is like this concept of death and how people view death and how they handle death. And it's why I do like the squire more than Antonius. I like that he's practical about it. I gravitate more to that character than the lofty concept driven Antonius. It's not my jam. Uh, but that's how uh, uh, it does make me think about it. And I've, I enjoyed uh, revisiting the concepts that Bergman lays out in this movie about death and about how we handle death and react to death. Uh, because this film is about the plague, but it's really about, it's just really, I'm sorry, the film is initiated by the plague, but it's really about confronting death. So many things that you said there that I, I want to respond to. They're so great. The most interesting one came at the end, which is that <laughs> you said, um, just because I literally is the opposite of what I was about to say, which is that you said that you, was, you, you relate way, way more to the squire than mm -hmm. the knight. And I was about to say that you are much more the knight and I'm much mm -hmm. more the squire because I'm the atheist and you're the person who has faith. And yet you also say you relate more to the squire, which I totally understand <laughs> because the lofty sort of detachedness of the knight is tough to yeah. relate to. You also brought up movie deaths and I just suddenly was going through in my yeah. mind you know, it's interesting that you you picked the Kirk death because as soon as you said movie deaths, the first death that came into my mind is Mr. Spock in Wrath of Khan, you know? And the other one that came into my mind was Glenn Ford in Superman. 
Oh yeah. You know, and that there's some really interesting like how do we approach this moment of death? Oh yeah. You know, Great death. That 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 are kind of fascinating to me. Mm-hmm. And, and and it goes back to so there's the famous right. uh book from Ernst Becker which is the de- denial of death mm-hmm. and the concept uh, you know, the basic concept of this book is that we build these massive constructs in our lives to try to protect right. ourselves from the reality of our own demise. And those constructs, yep. m- on the one hand, it, are about all the things that happen after death, heaven, hell, reincarnation, meeting your maker, rejoining the, the, the energy, life energy of the universe, whatever it is. And then we also have all these constructs within yeah. our lives of status and wealth and the accumulation of things and love and moments of pleasure. And those are all things, according to Ernst Becker, that exist to deny the reality of death. Yeah. You know, and this is a film yeah. that is all about confronting the reality of death. And maybe this is my final thoughts. Maybe maybe that's the, the, mm-hmm. the all I, I could just go into is that, is what's interesting right now is we're in this moment. We can't deny the fact that right now you and I are quarantined in our houses because of the coronavirus, yep. which could be mm-hmm. anywhere from a blip to something really, really scary. And yet in all of this, yeah. I don't think we're thinking, or I'm not really thinking about the reality of death. I still am denying mm-hmm. it on some level. Uh-huh. And and I return, and this is why I think this movie is so, it's such a profound film. And its intention is to be profound. Yeah, Like this isn't, we're not giving you a love story or an adventure or any plot or character development story stuff. We're really going, no, we are contemplating life and death and God and heaven and sin and all of those things. All of that's what we're doing here. And this yeah. is the powerful things that films can sometimes do. That we, of course, want movies to entertain. Of course, we want movies to scare us and to make us laugh and to give us joy and all this stuff. But in the end, this is a movie that contemplates death. And while it doesn't give us an answer, like I don't think this movie in any way says, mm-hmm. and this is how you should feel about death. In the end, Mia and Yoff and their little baby ride off into the daylight. That they, in the end, yeah. there's something in this film that says, embrace life. I don't know about death. I can't construct it. The, yep. the squire doesn't yep. have the answer. The knight doesn't have the answer. Nobody has the answer here. Embrace life. That's what I see. And that's right. what, in this right. crazy, crazy time where I'm trapped in the house with my wife and my son, Embrace life doesn't seem like such a bad philosophy to go forward with. <laughs> yeah, and um, I don't, you know, I kind of hit my final thoughts a little bit when I was talking about the death, answering your death question. But overall, uh, you know, I agree. I think the movie at the end of the day is saying, don't be so caught up with the concept of death or how you're going to, you know, you're going to miss everything that's around you. And it's something I said earlier in the podcast. He is so caught up with this idea of, well, I don't have what I thought I was supposed to have, or why can't I get the answers to these questions? Why doesn't God show himself to me in a way that I can understand? Why doesn't death uh, have the answers that I was asking for? Death is unknowing now. What the hell? I can't get the answers that I want. Don't be so caught up in trying to dissect and analyze your life that you forget to live life, that you forget to actually experience life, that you forget to actually, as you just said, Steve, embrace life. And that's what I think is this, mo- this movie is trying to say because everybody who's caught up in this whole concept of the dourness of life and where it's going to go and blah, 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 they just end up in the end dying anyway. So why not embrace the life and live it as, as enjoyably as you can before death comes, because guess what? Death is coming for everybody. So trying to get the answers and understand and blah, 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 is to me almost a futile obsession, and it's a way of not enjoying life, not embracing life, not living your life, uh, and taking the hits uh, and the struggles and the successes and the greatness that can come with it if you just live it instead of trying to analyze it the whole time. Don't stay out of it, stay in it, and that's... What I, I agree with you completely. I think that's what the film does say at the end. It's a, actually a happy ending that makes sense. You know, who knew that you and I could interpret the seventh seal of all things as a life-affirming 
in the end, life embracing film. <laughs> so that's what we think of The Seventh yes. Seal. Of course, we always want to hear what you think. Please visit us on our Facebook page. Do a search for The Cinephiles. You can subscribe to the show on iTunes, YouTube, Stitcher, or Spotify. You can support the show by going to patreon.com slash The Cinephiles. Please, by the way, leave your reviews on iTunes. They really, really do help. We appreciate every single one we get. Um, if you want to buy The Seventh Seal or stream it through Amazon Prime, along with every other movie we've ever done, you can do so at cinephiles.net. Mm -hmm. And you can always reach me on Twitter at SR Morris, on Instagram on SR Morris One. John, how about you? You can always reach me at The Roca Says on Twitter and on Instagram, all the stuff I'm doing there. And please come on over to my YouTube channel, www.youtube.com slash John Roca Says. See all the incredible content we're doing on there, movies, TV, reviews, uh, conversations about entertainment, news, sports stuff, pro wrestling stuff. We got everything you could possibly want uh, on a channel and more is coming down the pike. So please come and subscribe to that. And of course, listen to all the other podcasts that I do um, along with the Cinephiles here. Right. And if you want to actually follow the Cinephiles, you can do it at Cine underscore files on Twitter and the Cinephiles podcast on Instagram. Um, and I think that is it for this week. We will be back next time with another great film on the Cinephiles. <laughs>